Well, welcome back, everybody. This is episode four of the Bants in the Belfry podcast. Today, we are going to be chatting with Jordan Rain. Uh, I've known Jordan, I think, since 1993 or 1994. We both uh, met each other uh, while studying, uh, what was it, commercial rock and jazz performance uh, at Fitterea Polytechnic in 1993, 1994. Um, and I mean, I suppose we've been in each other's lives on and off ever since then and have never entirely lost contact. Um, she's one of those friends I would say is the sort of person you could actually not talk to for three or four years and then start talking to and just immediately pick up where you left off as if no time had passed. Um, uh, and as I said, she's probably, she's probably best known for her music. But um, as you'll see, I think today, there's a lot of things that she does extremely well. Uh, and I suppose it just happens to have been music that, that sort of um, got her attention, got her noticed. Um, but let's, let's crack on. Let's crack on. Uh... Hey there, Mom. Hey, Jordan. Hey. <laughs> How are you doing? <laughs> oh, thank you for such a nice intro. Hey, seriously. <laughs> well, it was, it was a little bit off the cuff. I probably should have thought more and considered more and done a better job. But um, it, was, no, it, was, really it was from awesome. the heart. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Oh, and it's so cool. To talk. And I remember, too, it was 93. It was 93. I remember crying with you and Jazz when Kurt Cobain died. And we were just sort of gobsmacked. Oh, and really? Like, yeah, that, that's when he died was 93. So we must have met in 93. Yeah, that's that's sort of coming back yeah. to me now, actually. That yeah. is sort of coming back to yeah, me. Yeah, do you remember? We had in Blood Flower and we were just sort of <laughs> all kind of dumbstruck by it. Eh? Yeah, I, I remember being told about it, actually. And... Um, You've met Richard, Richard, uh, my friend Richard, Richard Hall. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And he, uh, oh, actually, speaking of Richard, before I actually say that, uh, his wife, Shona, um, said to say hi to you because she remembers oh, that she used to meet okay. up with you in Auckland to practice your German together. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day. Oh, cool. yeah. yeah. So I said, I said I'd do that for her and I just remembered now. So now I've done it. Oh, thank you. Please, please greet them both for me. I will do. Um, yeah, Richard That's was, for some reason, yeah, has always been... Do you seem like yesterday? Sorry, say that again. What's that? What'd you say? Uh, just, just the... It was all the 90s, but I always feel like it feels like yesterday. It doesn't really feel like time has passed. No, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Um, you just pick up the conversation where you left it, I suppose. I was just going to say about Richard that he's always been the person in my life who lets me know about the thing that has happened. And I, I think he must just be more <laughs> tuned in to you know, happenings in the world that I am. And I'm, I'm like, hey, I read a lot of news, man. I'm I'm a bit of a news junkie. But he always gets mm -hmm. there first, and he always is the person who lets, like, 9-11, he was the person who let me know. And when Kurt Cobain committed yeah. suicide, he was the person who let me know. And there's probably, you know, three or four other things. Um, wow. Anyway. Anyway, uh, we're, so I've got, I've got a bunch of notes here and a million things to talk to you about. Um, but I thought, because, because you're probably best known in the world, um, for your music, and mm -hmm. and I imagine that a lot of the people who are going to listen to this will, you know, that that'll be how they've heard of you. Uh, yeah, I I thought that'd be a good place to start. Um, and uh, well, the question I have here, I suppose, is is what started your interest in music? Like, what kind of led you into becoming a musician and then going on that sort of journey? Um, well, yeah, well, let's start there and see where we go. Um, it, it's funny, too, because one's memory gets worse, but the, the first thing that came to mind was Fraggle Rock. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> you know, I love that yeah. show, man. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, too. And as a kid, I would, like, always transcribe the songs as best I could, you know, with what I think I knew about five chords at that time. Right. So, you know, I'd just play whichever one fit, fit kind of best and sing the melody over it, which sometimes is kind of dissonant, but... You know, the teacher that I had would say, oh, that's really, really quite interesting. And I think he was being genuine rather than nice. But yeah. um, I had actually, before, shortly before Fraggle Rock, I had a very good 
teacher who just sort of recognised that I didn't really sort of fit in a lot of ways. And he was a muso and he played a lot of songs, Simon and Garfunkel and things that my folks also played a lot of folk music at home. Mm. And it sort of resonated with that. And yeah, and then came Fraggle Rock. And that's when I started performing quite literally because I'd just copy these songs and it was popular at the time. And, you know, people go, oh, you know, play that one from Fraggle Rock. So. Right. Yeah, school. Fraggle Rock, you say. I have an extensive yeah, repertoire. Yeah, badly, badly corded versions of stuff that I had transcribed with possibly incorrect lyric. Yeah. Was was your favourite character Red? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I like the one who was, well, actually, you could probably guess which my favourite character was. Bobo. Was, okay, no, okay. Wembley. Wembley. Uh, no, not Wembley. <laughs> not Wembley. Was who was the one that that was always doing laundry and was kind of depressed a lot? Yeah, that's Boomer. Bo yeah, Bob yeah, yeah. Boomer. Yeah, Bobo Boomer. Boomer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Correct. He was quite a, an, um, a misanthrope and a pessimist. Yeah, 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 yeah. And just kind of slept around, but with a heart of gold. <laughs> Yeah, with a heart of gold. That's an exaggeration, though, of, of you. You're not that pessimistic. Yeah, <laughs> and my heart isn't that golden. <laughs> yes, it's that part's true. <laughs> um, oh, so that's, yeah, I know, I know that, um, well, let's see what I remember. Yeah, I've seen you performing in, uh, in country music competitions when you're maybe like oh, 11, God, 12, something like that. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. my father wanted to channel it into something where money was, and you know, because he knew everything about everything. Mm. The money was in country music, so I was, I was allowed to do that. Um, but yeah, it was painfully embarrassing, and I couldn't do it well actually either. Everyone would yodel, and like yodeling would win you something, you know. And I just could not yodel to save myself, mm. and you know, had a had a sort of an alto voice, which you know they also they do two things to impress people sort of yodel painfully, you know, mm. obviously well, but I found it painful, or sing these shatteringly high notes that I had no hope of reaching. So, yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> so so you couldn't hack it in country music is what I'm no, hearing. No, I don't and so country music. You had to go and do what, do what you did instead. Yeah, yeah I had to go through counselling to get over that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Brutal. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I was just having a look on your website, and and it said that you've actually released like ten albums, and I knew that it was quite a few. Um, I think it's twelve if you count the best of now. Oh right, right. Yeah, I, I looked as well, and I was like, wow, that's actually kind of a lot. But if if you live a long enough time, mm. then because <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've ever done like one a year or anything, except maybe the trilogy. But mm. yeah, it's if you if you're old enough you've done enough of them. I, I don't know if you know Matt Howden. He, he's doing some live shows actually at the moment, but he's produced some astounding number of albums and he said something similar, but I think he's, I think he's on 18, but yeah, he's, he's around my age as well. Yeah. Well, I suppose that's the thing. Like if you just keep working, like if you just keep yeah. writing songs, even if it's not at a, a breakneck pace or anything, you know, yeah. eventually just, uh, you got a dozen albums. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just don't die and you'll get there. Yeah, just don't die, and yeah, yeah, don't do the rock star thing, and you'll get there. Yeah, yeah, make it past twenty-seven, mm, which um, which yeah. you've done, and congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> I too, I too have achieved yeah. this. Yeah, we've both achieved something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, Kurt. Don't mean to rub it in, but yeah, here we are. I'm just trying to remember. I'm just trying to remember being twenty-seven. <laughs> oh. Yeah, God. Yeah, yeah we knew each other in 27. Yeah. yeah, we did. I, you know, I can't even remember what I was doing. Uh, you get to a certain age, and like, like when I was trying to figure out when we actually met, you have to kind of mm. reverse engineer it. Like, well, I know I started school in '88, and then so when I, and yeah. then I had a year, and then, and I, you know, I've seen my dad, mum, and dad do that my whole life. And it's like I'm never going to be that old that I have to kind of think about what year things happen. And it's like, well, here I am. Yeah, here I am. You do. One more way that adults were always right about things I thought that they would never be right about. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And, and often when you see yourself becoming that person that you remember when you were a kid, you're like, what adults talk about such boring shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, why are they concerned with these things? They're just so not 
inherently interesting. And then you find yourself just, you know, going on at length about exactly oh, those sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> and, and repeating yourself, you know, like making the same point three yes. or four different ways. Um, yeah. One of the yeah. things that, one of the things I've actually noticed with, uh, with talking to, to kids as an adult. And I think one of the reasons adults do repeat themselves a lot, not the only reason, but sometimes yeah. kids don't, they, they haven't learned that if you've heard something and understood it and received the message that you've got to give these kind of visual and audio cues. Uh, yeah. And they don't do it. And as an adult, it's like, you know, it's important that you understand this thing I'm telling you because, you know, mm. it might stop you getting killed tomorrow or whatever it is, right? Uh, but they're not giving you the feedback. So you, you're trying to just, you're repeating yourself just to try to ensure that they understand what you're saying. And then at some point That's when they... Point. Yeah. yeah. At some point when they get older, yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, no. Well, I was just going to say, some point when they get older, they either they figure that out. So they're like, you know, they do the voice pauses and they make the face that they're like, I'm paying attention, I'm paying attention, and yeah, you know, it's just a thought I've had a few yeah. times. I, I think you're right too, because as adults too, we make the effort to sort of, you know, give a quick summary of what we have understood mm. to check that we've understood it correctly. You know, so yeah. the person say, oh, no, actually, that's not what I mean. So, you know, they get the idea that, A, we've taken in the information and have come to some understanding. Uh, and, you know, that's another social click cue that kids, you know, they don't know to do that. Why would they mm. not do that? Yeah, well, yeah. I wonder if it's inherently it... impolite. Uh, yeah, that's, that's right. Really that's right. <laughs> um, actually, I was, I've been reading this biography of A.A. A. Milne uh, recently. I just finished it last night. And one of the things he says about children is that they're ruthless egotists, but their, their ruthless egotism is softened by their beauty. So, you know, they, they are very sweet and cute, um, but just just so self-centered. Like, it's almost they can't really imagine that the the world outside them exists or that they need to be really considerate of other people or care about what they do. And, and then he used a bunch of examples from his verse and poetry where he's pointing out exactly that. Uh, and, and, you know, I suppose making the case, I mean, I'm fucking, I'm digressing now, but making the case that that's why uh, people enjoy, both adults and children enjoy the poetry because, or his verse, because the children see themselves and the adults see children. And especially, you know, adults who've had, had kids and had a lot to do with kids. <laughs> yeah. Which I just, you know, I just thought was interesting. But anyway, enough about me um, <laughs> and my thoughts no, about I, I things. It's kind of interesting, actually, because it's one of the narratives I, I struggle with, you know, because it's a known psychological phase. All kids go through that mm. stage of complete egotism. It's, it's just a sort of natural process that they then sort of grow out of realising that, you know, there are other people who are similar enough to also have feelings yeah. and things. Most of them grow out of it. We've got this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most of some some of them might might grow out out of it for a short period of time and go back to it. But <laughs> yeah, the, this is a you said you know, and adults look at them and see them as charming. I've, I've never had that. And, <laughs> right. Um, I mean, it might be because of my school experience. I was I was bullied throughout school, so I I kind of right. see kids as, I guess, partly because of that phase, potentially dangerous. <laughs> and right. We've got this, the narrative mm. of, you know, the holiness of children. And, you know, when a child dies, it's far, far worse than when, a, when an old person dies, for example. Mm. And, you know, we see them as not having the chance to have, you know, gone through life and lived in the world. But um, it, it, it's kind of – I get that. I have that same inherent feeling. It's kind of tragic. But I don't know where the sort of holiness comes from when you have got this rampant egotism <laughs> because you know, I don't want to stick the label holiness on anything that's rampantly egotistical. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's potentially dangerous, and kids can be some of the meanest creatures. Um, oh, just, how, well, yeah, uh, unbelievably today, cruel. You know? Yeah, unbelievably. unbelievably cruel. Because they, they haven't developed sort of empathy, or if they have empathy, yes. well, they don't know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's the strange feeling of guilt? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ignore it and beat this kid up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but, I mean, on the topic of your music, I suppose. Um, so you've released a million albums. They're all really good, and people <laughs> should go and buy them and listen to them, and I'll, I'll, I'll link that out. There we go. Uh, <laughs> but, the Bandcamp link, please. Bandcamp yeah. is grand. Okay, yeah, and that, that actually, not to sound like I'm shilling too hard for Bandcamp, but they're doing those like free Friday things sometimes now where they don't yeah, take their I mean, cut. 
by, by all means say they're great because I think they are too because yeah. uh, you know as a, as a musician you see your your royalty statements come in and have oh, man. In from things <laughs> like Spotify and iTunes and things like Spotify and iTunes you literally get zero point and then several zeros yeah right and and you're like wow I mean wow thank you for my check for 23 cents Spotify yeah and even even like really famous people, I think Lady Gaga was one that had a, a, a big stink about it that um, she had sold X million copies of some song and just yeah. got like a couple of thousand dollars. And it's like, no, that, that doesn't compute. No. Um, so, yeah, it's just don't use Spotify or, or iTunes. <laughs> no, I mean, if, yeah, no, no, I mean, yeah, if you yeah. like the band, buy, go to Bandcamp, buy the fucking album. Yeah. Yeah, because um, it goes it goes to us, and a lot of us ship our own orders. So, yeah. you know, there's just they take the smallest cut of anybody, and um, the bands get you know the money direct. That, that yeah. actually made it really. Good. Like, it's disadvantageous to have a small label these days because um, you just they just end up getting a lot of it or most of the cash from orders on Bandcamp. But if you're a soloist, you you do get a large percentage of it. You know, not a soloist, yeah. a, a, an independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so no, they're good, good guys. Um, Guy, guys, I'm using, by the way, for those of you who are not from New Zealand, it's, it's non gender specific. I always have to point that out. When I sorry, what? Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm the same. I, you know, specific. and, and I, I think it's about something for me too about growing up in a kind of rock context. I'm always like dudes and guys. Yeah, and um, still. and it's like really, I'm not gendering this. I've just referred to groups of people greater than one using these terms. Yeah. For as long as I can remember, um, don't make me change. I'm too old. I can't do it. Uh, that was one of the other things I noticed about being old. And you because know, when I, if I am in a circumstance where I need to speak English, I'll start with the dude and guys. Yeah. And I realised that you know these men probably know that those words were relatively hip in the early '90s and are now just like yeah. really passe. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> they get some very strange. Do you, do you remember us ironically using slang in the '90s that was older than the '90s? You're like I, I remember you would you would refer to things as rad. And red was like a term oh, yeah, that, you know. I got that, that from Rob, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he started doing that and I found it hilarious. Yeah, me yeah, too. He would use that incredibly outdated slang. Yeah, and I remember like <laughs> deliberately doing it. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I sort of wonder if it's actually become associated with the 90s at all just through so many people ironically using slang that was older. Using it uh, in the 90s, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> It probably has. Yeah, maybe. At least uh, in New Zealand, in our little, little yeah, microcosm, yeah. things yeah. are different. Our cultural backwater. Yeah. Oh, here comes the cringe again. At least I don't have to hear my voice. Yeah, yeah. Never I mind. noticed that um, there's so much stuff about our culture that I didn't realise till I spent many years with a pole. And, yeah, because um, you're soaking yeah, in it, right? He, he... What's that? Because you're soaking in your culture when you're in it, right? That's, yeah. If you go outside. Don't ask a fish about water because, you know, they, they just take yeah. it for granted. What's water? It's, yeah, yeah. Well, water is just always there, so you know I haven't been forced to consider it deeply. Mm. Um, it's just part of my universe. Um, so yeah, and he actually, when he came to Auckland, because you, you met him when we came down to Wellington, but the first thing he said was, um, "This looks like Sim City," and oh. I looked at it sort of newly, and he was right. It's like this brand new looking city that arises up out of this prehistoric forest, like you know someone has just placed it there overnight. Yeah, that's never and, occurred to me. It's never occurred to me either. And mm. as soon as he said it, I was like, Jesus. And yeah, you see, you see it quite differently. And he's, like, you know, he's like, you guys are, you guys are always so happy. It's like some obligation to be happy all the time. You know, why, why don't you know? Because yeah. are quite open, openly grumbly, which I find very refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's like, you know, you tell people things are fine when they're not. Why do you do that? You know. <laughs> it's it's just, like, yeah, we tend it's to just try. the way. Yeah, compulsory happiness, um, and he's like, you know, it's kind of unhealthy uh, sometimes because you you don't get to say what's on your mind. Yeah, yeah, mate. I mean, I honestly, I have, I haven't reflected on it, but uh, I suppose there is that kind of veneer of shit's great. Um, yeah. Or at least not so bad. You know, we don't like yeah. to we don't like to hit the extremes too much in in our conversations. Like, you, you... yeah, that, that's exactly it. And I've I've literally heard people say, you know, oh, your your mum's dead, but it's good that your dad's still alive. <laughs> and you're like, Fuck. and having lived in Europe for a long time, just no way I'd say that to somebody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. So like, please, this person's in pain. Give them some <laughs> sympathy. Yeah, well, you've had your five seconds, so... Yeah, yeah. Like your dad's yeah. over here. And that's the other thing we do. It's like we... we it's very English, I noticed, because I spent mm. a lot of time in England too, jollying people along. Yeah, that would have been my assumption that that would be culturally where it came from. Sorry, I, that would that would have been my assumption that that culturally that's that's where it came from, from England. Yeah, yeah, and I've noticed in Poland that people were literally sitting in the bar. We had we had this kind of interesting group. Of some a, a guy called Mike stuck in the seventies, um, a guy called Christian stuck in the eighties, me stuck in the nineties, and <laughs> we'd sort of that, that's really grumbling sessions because you know a lot of the Poles had really genuinely difficult lives. Yeah, and they'd sort of grumble and grumble, and then. You just fall into this dark silence. And <laughs> it was sort of at first kind of uncomfortable for me as a Kiwi. Mm. And I was like, fuck, what do I say? You know, oh, sorry about communism. <laughs> <laughs> you sit there and eventually it dissolves or they'll come up with an interesting, you know, dark but amusing or interesting story themselves. And it's a very consolatory silence. You notice after you get past your own massive discomfort. Um, but yeah, it's it's in a way they seem to process it better than, than we do as Kiwis. Yeah, that discomfort does does sound very Kiwi uh, to me. Yeah. Like yeah. You, you really want to jump in if that shit happens. Yeah, and console and jolly yeah. along and make them laugh. And, and mm. it's just not necessarily... You got to sort of gauge in, in both Germany and Poland. You gauge whether that's actually appropriate, because right. sometimes it's really not. You know, sometimes it is. But it's about you know being equally comfortable with the good emotions and the bad emotions and everything that's bland in between. <laughs> mm. Yeah, um, yeah, admirable. Um, uh, well, sorry, I'm, I'm still on your music and stuff. Are, are you? Are you sort of sort of retired now? Is that your yeah, kind of position? Yeah, um, it's partly forced and partly, you know, one of those things where you don't know if it's the the natural. Um, you know, people talk about writer's block, and mm. I, I literally do not believe in it um, because yeah. I find there's just these natural periods of where you're in an absorbing phase, and if yeah. you start worrying, oh God, I'm never going to do output. I mean, yeah, yeah, output yeah. is a very very capitalist society thing. Constant output, or there's something wrong with you. Yeah, but if you just relax and go, well, no, I'm I'm absorbing stuff. Yeah, um, you're filling yourself back up, right? Yeah, yeah, and then something comes. Sometimes it takes a year, sometimes three. You know, just just don't worry. If you start worrying, then you're not going to come up with anything. So, I'm in either an absorbing phase or <laughs> it's petering out. Uh, I don't know, um, but you know, at the same time, I'm I'm, I'm really enjoying painting. I told yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to I wanted to get onto that actually uh, as well. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of quotes here, and one was actually for you. Remember your English professor? Was it Mike? Was that his name? Ah, uh, yeah, Mike. Yeah. yeah, I remember him saying about you, or maybe you told me he said about you that you're just someone who likes to make beautiful things. Oh, remember that? Really? Yeah. Maybe no, he said, he, maybe he said it to me and and not to you. Yeah. Or maybe. Yeah. We've both forgotten, or you've forgotten. That, that, would, that would be right, though. Um, I had there's a really cool friend uh, I had in Poland, actually. One of the one of the people that sort of sit in the grumble group, but really interesting guy. He's a sculptor, and he works at the university there. Um, and we had a lot of conversations about basically being in service to art, mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, you know, the, the the blessing that we have is not that you know we are artists who you know through our massive talent we make some stuff mm. um it's more that you know this this is the phase i've sort of moved into the gratitude for the fact that these ideas come from somewhere and sort of flow through you and it's your job to sort of ask them what they want to become and i, I really noticed it doing painting uh, i noticed it a bit in music but um more so with the visual stuff because you end up stopping and staring and thinking well what what do you want to be? What what would balance you, sort of thing? What what sort of works for you? Right. And it's a far more uh, it's a far different approach than sort of you know some people are sort of gifted or whatever and they they do these things. It's very ego based again, like you know our culture. <laughs> it's more like there are, there are just thousands of us out there who who somehow manage to let these ideas you know come through us or, or however you want to look at it and. It's that sort of energy that we turn into something, hmm. um, but it's not necessarily, 
you know, us doing it. I guess a lot of songwriters, you know, because a lot of my listeners are songwriters too, will have experienced that where sometimes there's just a song that just comes out. You don't have yeah, to yeah. think about it. And you don't you feel that responsible for it, right? Yeah, you've you've had that experience too. Yeah, definitely. Not that many yeah, times, like, but yes. Um, I just know what to I just know what to play to this. Mm. It's just there, and you haven't consciously created it, so to speak. It just sort of flows. Yeah. Um, and those are the best artistic experiences for me. Mm. And um, it's when you it's when you're not there. How do you get out of your own way? <laughs> how How do you know when you've finished something, like artistic? Uh, speaking of that same mic, um, <laughs> yeah. he once told me, because um, he's an author, yeah. yeah. he said a book is never finished, it's just abandoned yeah, at yeah. some point. <laughs> I've heard that said in reference to poetry yeah, as well. It's just, and I know that mixing's the killer for me. It's oh, just like, I, I just don't get me started, it. man. Oh, it's just, yeah. it's a nightmare. I mean... It's and it, it's never and it's never right. It's never enough. It's never ever going to be a hundred percent. And I bet you notice this too. Eh? Sometimes years later, you go back and you still hear the pot levels. Yeah. Fuck start, man. Yeah. Fuck. But use a bit more pen there, and the yeah. EQs off. And so that's also at some point abandoned. <laughs> but yeah. you have to train yourself to to notice. You know, I I know when I hear other people's music. Mm. I'm not listening like that, and I won't hear the last three percent. You know, yeah. I'll only hear clang, you know, crashing errors. Um, yeah, and so that's long right. as we don't have crashing errors, then it's okay. It's good to go. Yeah, I often think about those poets, like Walt Whitman would be one who would just keep working on the same poets, the same poems over and over. And like, I mean, I've, I've often been tempted to do that. And in fact, the fact that most of my poetry is online on a blog means that I can do that. And sometimes I just uh, go back and I just, you. you know, tweak a word here, maybe delete a line here. Um, oh, and so, and, that's horrible. And they're never finished. Yeah, yeah. It's too tempting. Yeah. Because we can't. When it's released, it's like, yeah, done. Yeah, that's we'll right. It. Too bad if you want to change something. Too bad if you hear that yeah, pot level that's forever. That would be the worst. That's the yeah, worst. <laughs> it is. It's not good. Yeah. You have, you have to make sure you print a book, even if it's just like, for your own sake, to say this stops here. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not yeah. a bad idea. I, I, well, yeah. I printed a chat book once, but I mean, I printed it and bound it myself, and you know, there's like yeah. twenty copies or something. Um, yeah, but, but at least there are twenty copies. You can't change it now because well, will I still have the poems online. Ah. <laughs> I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, and in, in, in terms of your your music, you've you've played some really big gigs and sort of festivals and stuff in your time. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if you have any like standout sort of stories or experiences from, from operating at that tier of, um, uh, the standout one is there's, there's so many bizarre ones or stand out for different reasons. Yeah. Oh, one stands out for a really hilarious reason. Yeah, uh, it was in the North of England. Um, I think it was with the men that will not be blamed for nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was not sort of a major gig. They're a really cool band, but, um, we got there and it had been an eight hour drive or, or train ride, exhausted. And, you know, you usually get a ride or some sort of food at the end. And the woman there, she was an incredibly lovely, you know, warm hearted woman who obviously really enjoyed the cake herself. So she had baked us just a cake. It was just cake. And I didn't know at the time, but I had, I now realized the reason for this. I was, start, I had started to go through menopause. Oh. So I was like, Christ, I'm so hungry. I don't eat cake. You know, I just don't eat cake. And, and today I eat cake. Else. I'm going to eat cake. Yeah. And um, I had the worst hot flashes. I thought I was dying of a heart attack. <laughs> oh, man. And I was trying to sleep, and my then partner was there. It's like, Jesus, you're sweating like a pig. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. And it was just all the sugar, you know. Um, right. So that stands out for that reason. Yeah. Um, Liebach was really cool. Um, I really, really enjoy the company of those guys I, I still go to their gigs just you know just for fun and to meet them yeah um, when i can yeah what are they like but, as um, people i suppose uh, insanely interesting and intellectual and it was it was bizarre that um because ivan invited me to slovenia to visit one year and it was around new year's so lots of people having parties and you know um at, at some point um i had i had several gigs there too um and after one of the gigs there was um, a bunch of people stayed around. It was a women's music festival. Mm -hmm. And they started singing a partisan song from um, 
that they knew from Tito times when there's a sort of partisan army that hid out in the forest. Oh, wow. It sort of persisted through communist times, and it just felt like the most amazing thing that I was allowed to be witness to this piece of history that hardly anyone even knows about, you mm. know, and uh, lots of his mates were having parties and they were like gallery owners and things, and it just seemed to me that the whole of Slovenia – uh, sort of, you know, uh, lefty, open-minded um, intellectuals with a penchant for art. <laughs> it, was, right. it was just wonderful. Yeah. Um, and then there was a night when, because uh, I did some support gigs for them, and I was going to train from one show to the next, but they had a space on their bus. And um, sleeping on this bus, it was like being in a coffin. Uh, and they were just really, really small. I've never been on a tour bus before, but everything's luxury. You've got big screens and you've got a kitchen and everything. But then when you go to sleep, it's in a coffin. And the Polish roads are so bad. Yeah. <laughs> that it just jiggled the whole night until I felt like my teeth were going to fall out and did not get a wink of sleep. It was it was an insight into what rock and roll isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is. Cause well, that's why you, that, at that point, that's why you need a heroin habit so you can sleep yeah, yeah, between yeah, gigs, right? Yeah, so you can sleep, absolutely. <laughs> that's yeah, why they all did it. It's not like we had drunk enough whiskey, eh? Because mm. everyone's a whiskey trigger. Yeah. Yeah. Alcoholic oh, junkies God. just to get enough yeah, sleep yeah. between gigs. Just to sleep. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, God. Yeah, I don't know how they do it because, you know, driving from Slovenia to, to any other country in Europe, you're going through mountains, you know. It's, yeah. yeah you, you see with a lot of the old rockers, they, I suppose, as if they continue and they have the means, they, it's, you know, the, the level of luxury just keeps creeping up and uh, yeah. the level of like debauchery trends down. Um, yeah, it does. They, they just can't do it. <laughs> they just can't do it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, you can't do it. And also, you know, when, when they drink whiskey or something, it's not to excess. And it's basically to have some sort of intellectual conversation or or just have, you know, a fun conversation or listen to, you know, horrible old jazz in the Vance case. He had mm. music taste that we, we didn't get on in terms of music taste. <laughs> but, yeah. No, it surprises me. Well, maybe, maybe it doesn't. I mean, yeah, like I'm sure you found the same thing with musicians in general that, the, the music that their actual output is might not necessarily mm. inform you at all with regard to what they enjoy listening to. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really true. People are quite so sometimes horrified when they say my favourite music is, is generally like just sort of really grim metal, doom metal or grindcore. Just yeah, yeah. Any, and, I, and I'll add this, you know, anything with hate and rage in it. Because <laughs> there's not an obvious relationship. Well... Maybe lyrically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have an anger problem? It's like, well, no, because I vent it through listening to that. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, um, I mean, I actually, I remember us speaking of words and lyrics. Um, I do remember us discussing poetry quite a lot back in the day. And I also, I mean, from having read a lot of your lyrics, they're, you know, it, it's top shelf content. Um Jordan, oh, like, uh, they're, they're really, you know, it's, what would you call it? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I do think, like, writing lyrics for songs is, is a form of literature, you know. Obviously, there are constraints in the form, but there are constraints in every form that you produce words in. Uh, but I don't think I realised sort of how into prose you were until I edited oh. that book you wrote. <laughs> uh, yeah. And maybe, like... Really no one knows about. <laughs> yeah, 06, 07. Are we allowed to talk about it? I mean, I wasn't going to... Yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the dead. Yeah. Um, but I suppose at that point I did realise that that you you were a prose writer as well and a good one. Uh, and you've actually, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what your situation is now, but it, it, at least for some time you've made a living out of writing, right? Yeah. Um, interactive fiction, which I always mm. have to explain what that is because I myself did not know. Yeah, go ahead. But it's basically a book, you know, where you, where you um, read us a passage and then you've got a choice. So, you know, the example would be, you know, you, you're going through some field or a forest and you meet a dragon. Do you A, run away, B, try and kill it, C, try and befriend it, D, you know, commit suicide to spare yourself the agony or whatever, you know? And, Me. Um, it, yeah, yeah, I was going, well, you might pick the last one. <laughs> Me too, by now. Yeah. Wow, that was a great book. Three pages long. <laughs> that was a great book. Yeah, you have zero points. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh, you have not developed your character. Wow, how art imitates life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, hey, but we got past 27. We did. Uh, woohoo! Suck it, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the next one would be Befriend the Dragon, I think, yeah. for you and I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I wrote. Well, the first one was a black comedy. I don't. I don't know if you read it. I read uh, the one about the cat. Yeah. I, yeah, I bought that cat. one. Yeah. And see, I, I would compare it to. I don't know if you remember them, but they had like choose your own adventure books, pick a path type books. Yeah. When I was young, that, sort of like that, that sort of thing. Analogy I always used, and I love that, but I didn't realise how eighties it is. And yeah, super eighties. No, we're they don't know about. what we talk about. Yeah. You kids. Yeah. Yeah, you you're, kids. You're, you're being read born stuff. at a different time. How yeah, dare read you? stuff which trees have died for. That's not right. Just online. Don't let them die and not be and very, well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they get read for a while, but then the books just collect dust somewhere. Don't yeah. let them collect dust. Yeah. Oh, the cool thing in Germany, they've got these little like libraries that uh, look like the English uh, telephone booths. Um, I've seen them here in Gerlitz, they have them, and they have oh, yeah. them in, uh, Munster, and yeah, I like the idea. You just go there, grab a book, put one in. And oh, yeah, I've, there, there's a few of those around here, too. Not not many, but I've oh. seen about half a dozen that people have just created. Uh, yeah, yeah no, same deal. I it's a cool idea. Yeah. I've swiped a few books and left none behind because I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you oh. always feel guilty eh, when you take something you think is a treasure and you've left something that you really disliked. That you, yeah, it's toilet paper. Yeah. Uh, Which will pollute someone else's mind. Um, <laughs> Share the joy. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, like in terms of writing, how do you relate the the experience of writing or what goes into your writing and so on to your experience with music? Like what do you see the similarities and differences and – I mean, obviously, there's there's lyrics um, with songs as well, but but prose is quite a different thing. Um, I'm just kind of curious. It's, yeah, very different. It's uh, with songs. I find it uh, sometimes I really like limitations because it gives me yeah boundaries. Of, I guess a, a boundary. Yeah, because you you know that old the, the old cliche about being faced with a sheet of white paper. Yeah, that's right. You don't know where to start. Um, and with a song, you're like, well, it. It shouldn't really be over five minutes long because that would be a bit self-indulgent. Mm. You know, three minutes, yeah, uh, maybe if I'm lucky. But um, so, and because I like to tell stories in a lot of the songs that do yeah. actually have some sort of narrative, yes. that's really, really tricky to fit it all in. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, obviously you've got this sort of rhyme rhythm stuff and added to that, uh, there's certain vowels that, you know, just uh, you can sing better. So... Yeah, when you you have to be careful with singing too, don't you? Not to not to yeah. end lines on a certain vowel or consonant. Yeah, and consonants. I I've just sort of ignored that one. Uh, <laughs> I had I had a pop filter to get around it, but now I just deliberately enunciate badly if I have to use a word with p or t in it. Sweet. Um, <laughs> yeah, but in terms of projecting vowels, I'll sometimes have to change a word just because you know the the vowel will be swallowed otherwise. Right. Um, or, or it just sounds so much more resonant. So you've got that too, um, and that that makes it tricky. And I do like I like to sort of have rhythm that fits as well. So mm -hmm. it's super restrictive, but for that reason, it's a bit like a puzzle, you know. And I like that. Aspect. Yeah, or like writing like formal poetry, I suppose. You know, where you have a very yeah, strict. Yeah. Uh... Almost, it almost is. Almost is. Yeah. Mm. We get away with far more assonance, though, than, than you know, you guys that write, you know, it's sort of with legitimate rhymes. Uh, we'll just do it close enough, yeah. mm. <laughs> and it works. You can just pronounce it slightly wrongly or whatever. Yeah, well, because um, you have the rhythm and the melody to kind of back your, you know, to as a, as a bit of a safety net, yeah. right? Like, you can say almost yeah. anything, and if it still fits the tune, your ears will yeah. accept it. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, they'll, they'll experience it as, as rhyme and structure. Mm. Yeah. And with, with prose, it's it's just sometimes really freeing that you can just you can really go into intricate detail. Um, a lot of the time, the stuff that makes things really personal, because in songs, especially if you're telling a story, you know, a lot of the stuff that makes for a good story is sort of grounding it in, in the real experiences that people have. Like you know, I don't know, the, the sound of glass on a on a on uh, the sound of ice in a glass being like the grinding of teeth or something, and you know that sort of detail that sets a scene. Mm -hmm. or a tale where something else entirely happens but you know that sort of places you there and you have a lot lot less space and time for that in a song right. so it's really it's tricky 
but I, I like the trickiness of it and it makes you it makes the rush far more far far more potent when you get it right or when you think you've got it right you know you're like yeah i fit all that in four minutes thank god yeah boom <laughs> yeah boom yeah instead of you know <laughs> it took me it took me 100 years to write many many pages oh. but, you know then often you, you you're a lot more I guess with prose, you like yeah. That's I have said exactly what I wanted to say, and that's that's exactly how I wanted to get it across. Whereas with songs, there's always things that you might feel you've left out, or you know, could have added. You know, what would were people uh, interested in listening to twelve minute blurbs? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, one thing that really always impresses me with people who can write, I guess, longer form stuff, is um. Just, just your ability to like, and and I mean, I would say this is true of you with music as well. Like, you you clearly have the ability to just sit down and make some progress on something every day, and just keep doing that until it's done. Whereas I, Thank you know, you. I feel like that now. <laughs> well, I mean, you've got twelve albums and like any amount of writing that that says you know that you manage to finish things and you manage to do projects that take a lot of time and that can't be a, a, accomplished. I mean, I think. Once upon a time, for me, uh, something had to be finished in one sitting, and now I can probably do things that take about three weeks. You know, that I've managed to get my ability to stick to something up to about there. But um, it, oh, it it just blows me away. People like you who can actually just just grind away at stuff and stay creative and inspired uh, and productive in that sense. Uh, and I mean, do you do you find any challenge like? doing something the length of a book like that man you strip you gave me was 110,000 words um yeah. i don't know i don't know how long it took you but just the fact that you were able to produce and it you know how the cat because there's so many choices in it that yeah. was something like 600,000 words fuck me yeah because of course you know the, the reader doesn't experience that because no. they've made a ton of choices no um, but yeah 600,000 words it's it was a fucking mammoth <laughs> jesus christ <laughs> yeah yeah and so i mean do, do you, I mean, evidently, whether you struggle with it or not, you can get past it, but do you struggle with staying focused and applied to big projects like that or not? Well, yeah, um, this is this is the interest, another interesting thing about middle age. It's, mm. um, I guess it's harder to, but um, it's that sort of process. I don't, have you hit your midlife crisis yet, Barney? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. What, what would... What does it look like? I mean, I, no, I think... This is the thing. Mm. It's tricky to describe because uh, there's quite a lot of, you know, really good books on it, particularly by um, Jungian psychologists like, like James Hollis and things. Um, right. But most of it is pitched at people who've basically, you know, done the life that was expected of them. They've yeah, often was... done quite well in it, you know, quite successfully. But, you know, the, the sort of career job and things that, right. things that fit. Well, and, neither of us have done that, right? Yeah, and this is the issue. Um, so you get you get to the midlife, which you know is sort of uh, signposted by questions of being. What am I here for? Is you know what what do I really value? How do I want to spend the rest of my time? Um, and obviously, if you've if you've done these sort of career job things, it's there are a lot more people who go, "Good lord, what? Why did I do that? That's not actually in fitting with the, the yeah. person that I yeah, am." Yeah, and, and I see that and, a lot. They switch. They switch to creative pursuits that they didn't yes. follow. But for us who've been doing creative pursuits the whole time, and they either didn't work out in a in a way that now sustains us, as in my case, um, mm. you know, it's like, well, well, snap, really. You know, obviously, I'm not going to go the other way and get. You know, I'm not going to go into a career job. Mm. Um, so you know, I've been. I, my last job was a carpenter <laughs> before that. Oh look, I mean, I'm working at a at a gym as an admin. I have a one day a week yeah. sort of doing, IT job. Oh, yeah, and now I'm doing promo um, at a, at a um, for a naturopath. That's actually a lot more enjoyable. But you know, we just we're just like, well, okay, uh, the creative part is not going to sustain me mm. uh, financially, and you know, you've got the health issues thing coming. You you can't do it like yeah. you used to. Yeah, that's right. Um, you, you're sort of old enough that you don't see that it's going to you know, suddenly blossom into some sort of huge career because you're older. Yeah. Um, and well, and also, from here. And I mean, with music too, it's brutal for people who are older, right? Yeah. 
yeah, it's, it's brutal. I, I've toured with uh, um, quite a lot of older bands. I find I find them super interesting. They're full of stories. Mm. Um, and there's oh god, who were they? Oh, I can't. That's some some punk punk band from the seventies. So they were all in their like late fifties. One of them had had several heart attacks. Right. And they're still on the road, and they're still like doing the grind and you know some of them would still sort of drink afterwards perhaps and you know look all the worse for it and others would just sort of just be too tired and go to bed but it's just it just became apparent to me this you know it's, it's not really sustainable you know particularly if you have actual serious health issues yeah. um you know which unfortunately i do by now um and yeah so where to from here and that i haven't found a book on that so if anyone listening knows any books about that Particularly yeah. from Jungian psychologists, <laughs> I'd be really interested because, oh. um, yeah, we, we don't really know where to go from here. That's that's the big, you know, crisis of meaning that we're not sure how to answer because we did we did actually get to, you know, live our sort of creative expression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I don't know if you ever get this feeling, but often I kind of look at my contemporaries, like people I grew up with, and see what they're doing with their lives. And I'm not envious of it at all, but I feel like, yeah. am I am I missing something? Like, is there something that I don't understand about what I'm seeing that I should be like, fuck, you should feel like you're missing out on this thing and then jump into it. Like, should I have a house? <laughs> should I own a house? Should I have a, a nice car? Should I have like four or five kids by now? I mean, yeah. Um, well, the good thing about that, Barney, that's exactly because, yeah, we, we, I think I used to think that too. Should I, should I feel envious? Um, the people our age who have all those things mm. are not envious either because they're uh, of, you know, other people in this situation because they're like, ah, fuck, I have these things. And it turns out yeah. it wasn't the answer I thought that it was. And so, you know, this is why the midlife crisis is so is, is, is such a cliche because it happens to so many people. You're just like, yeah. I've done all the right things and yet I feel like something's wrong, something's yeah. missing. See, uh, it, and it must be me, it must be my fault because on paper everything is good. Why don't right. I feel good? Yeah. And I, I think that happens particularly for people who have just followed the rails, right? Like I'm not, exactly. I'm not necessarily – like if you choose the rails – then fine. But I think at the point most people could or could not choose the rails, they don't really have the perspective or uh, kind of meta understanding to be able to make an informed choice about it. They can't really weigh up the alternatives. They're, they're just not yep. psychologically ready or, you know, capable of doing that. So they just follow the rails. And like you say, yeah, yeah, they could be pushed. To tell us that's what we want and yeah, to tell yeah. us what we want. So a lot of people don't have a chance to even think about what they want. No. Um, it's like, oh, then I go to university and then I do this and then I, like, sign up for this firm and yep. then I've got to have a house and then I've got to get married and, you know, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Whatever the things are. Yeah. Whatever the list is, yeah. Yep. Uh, and they might not even really kind of conceptually. I mean, I've got a friend who, uh, he'd be, I think he's either my age or maybe a year older, and he's, he's sort of done all those things. Um, mm. But it's... I think probably for a few years now he's been like I just I just hate what I'm doing I like oh it, it it sucks and he's actually gone and um, he's retraining he's gonna he's basically sold up his interest in his business quitting everything he's doing like his kids have all gone through school and stuff so you know that yeah. so his family's not going to be ruined by the the decline in earning power I suppose but uh, he's just retraining as a as an EMT. Because he'd been doing it, yeah, he'd been doing it as like a, you know, a, a, vol a volunteer thing. And he actually yeah. realized that, wow, I, I, this is really fulfilling to me. I really enjoy it and it's uh, extremely interesting. And I'm just going to go do that with my life at, you know, 46. Uh, and yeah. so he's going back to school for three years, hanging out with like 17 and 18 year olds, which I did myself because yeah. I, I don't know if I told you, but I, I did finally finish a fucking qualification. I got my BA. I got my BA. Ah, uh, and I shit, and I actually well, I only received it this year, but I finished it last year. Yeah. And uh, what did you do your BA in? Philosophy oh well, well? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. 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 Well, I did. Well, my my degree incorporated philosophy, so I did do a few fill yeah. papers in it. Um, but it was actually yeah. in uh, music technology, of all things. Oh wow. Yeah, and so I I learned a lot of interesting stuff. Um. 
that I will probably not make any money out of or go into any really yeah. related field. But for me, it but was... That's not, that's not what you're going in there for. No, it? no. Well, it was more to prove to myself that I could do it and also learn a bunch of stuff about things that I was interested in that might kind of help me kind of creatively in terms of my own output in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are was, you still playing guitar? Um, I'm still doing music stuff. I, I mean, I still have guitars and I pick them up every once in a while. Um, but I... I know for me music is and writing is the same it's like every once in a while I just like holy shit I need to do this intensely for a while and I will and it could be like a few weeks a few months whatever I produce a bunch of stuff and then I just put it away and I don't want to look at it <laughs> until the next time I, I sort of get that urge so I mean well, you've just described exactly the creative process that's that's what I do mm. <laughs> I think that's well, what you all do I think know? I think maybe your urges urges sort of you can sustain them better than I can. I'm doing that all the time. Yeah. Uh, maybe, but that's, you know, I, I guess I've, you know, I forced myself to for a lot of wrong reasons, mm. you know, it's, um, that's a sort of basic pattern. It doesn't matter how much you amplify it, you know, that's, it's a sine wave. It's just maybe lower hills and that, that's all. It's the same pattern. Mm. You know, I think some of us just sort of push ourselves to roll with it more or, or think that we shouldn't, you know, yeah, and um, actually there was another quote that I wanted to drop on you, and this was from my one of my philosophy uh, professors at university. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And he was talking to everyone. It was like a sort of philosophy of music paper. Um, yeah. And he said, guys, unless you really, really love music, don't do it. Don't try and make a living out of it because it's too hard. Uh, yes. And I was like, that, that, really stuck, that really stuck with me. And I was like, I don't love it enough. I don't love it enough to, to really try and make a living out of it. I like it and I enjoy it. And sometimes I get quite involved with it. But I mean, the people I've seen in music who have really done, let's say well, or really stayed involved in it and kind of made a living out of it, something like that. I mean, for one thing, they've, they've usually, they usually uh, live in a country that's, that there's a bigger audience than there is in, you know, New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, ugh, it's, the only thing harder than probably making a living out of music in New Zealand would be trying to make a living out of poetry, <laughs> which yeah, I think possibly this does not have the population, no. base, especially because you know you and I both do alternative music. It's like mm. the one percent of of you know what a thousand people who buy music, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. tiny one one percent of of in in Germany for eighty million and Poland sixty million. You know, yeah, that's right. That is is a lot significantly more people. That's right. And so you, so you need to love it in order to keep doing it when it's super difficult, which will be most of the time, if not all of most the time. Of the time. Um, yeah. I mean, difficult in terms of like, I need to pay my rent, I need to eat, you know, etc. Mm. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I need to I fix mean, that, my car. That, that's underrated too, is the, you know, the price to, this is the other thing about those books. It's They write it, you know, go into the, the creativity that you never, you know, did in your youth because, you know, and I'm all for that actually, but yeah. it's um, it's a little in the direction of, you know, go and make that sort of your thing, your career without saying what the price is. Yeah. Um, and sure, if, if you have actually done a career job and have, have earned significantly and then turn to do it, you know, maybe cash is not an option, then that's cool. Yeah. But, you know, for those of us who've done it, you know, the whole time, mm. it's you, you hear countless stories about people that just, you know, have, having crises alone in their hotel room because they hate being alone in their hotel room. I liked that aspect of touring. But, you know, there's, there's the other things like when you plan a tour yourself and it's almost done and a few people cancel and you've invested all of your tiny mm. resources in it, the whole tour falls apart and you literally cannot pay the rent and end up homeless. And that's happened to me twice. Twice. You know, and it's... Yeah, twice. And it's just like once it happens the first time, you are permanently terrified that it will happen again. Right. And it's kind of just like this this niggling fear that makes you perpetually mm. uncomfortable. And um, you know, obviously too, one that you know, every musician experiences that will this gig go horribly wrong? Because mm. you know, even if you perform at your best, oh, you know, yeah. maybe the tone tech the tone tech will slaughter you, the sound tech. Yeah, yeah. And um or you know, the equipment will fail or, you yeah, know, a fight will break out. Like a million yeah. things can go wrong. 
you know, millions that aren't your fault. And, and you're in this constant state of hyper arousal, you know, and it's <laughs> exhausting. Mm. And that's even when you're just booking tours or, or, you know, you're on Facebook and you're like, oh, have I picked a bad time of day to promote this thing? Oh, God, it's got no traction. Oh, I've fucked up, you know. <laughs> you know, everything just becomes this, you know, all important because, you know, you don't have a backup financially. And therefore, you just over worry about stuff that's, not even related to the process of creativity, sadly. Mm. And you don't have yeah. your like so corporate career to kind of, to you know, break you up. Yeah. to cushion that. That's not what about when they say, you know, oh, well, now that you're 50, yeah. uh, go go into the creative arts. Because a lot of, you know, midlife crises are not only for the rich. They're mm. also for people that are already, you know, poor, but also don't like their job. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> and then they want to go and be a painter. And it's like, God. It's setting you up for a hard time. <laughs> what here? Why do you keep shooting yourself in the foot? Why are you like this? <laughs> yeah. Shoot yourself in the foot in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. hand's looking a bit healthy. Maybe I should shoot myself in the hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh man. And don't get me wrong. I'm not. For, I'm not saying don't go painting after no, you no, no. decide you hate your office job. But the, the rewards are unlikely to be financial. Yeah, exactly. It's it's that. Yeah. 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 Um, mm. uh, so, I mean, it was helpful for, for my professor to say that because it, it did make me think, yeah. well, okay, I'm not going to try and make it my life uh, yeah. because I don't love it enough. And I, I do like it. And I suppose the things that I some well, I don't know, <laughs> maybe I just can't stay in love with things in a sustained way, you know. I can be in love with something for a while maybe a few weeks. I mean, people, that's different, but um, yeah. creative pursuits, I, I think, uh, for struggle more. Um, As well, Edgar, I think, too, you're inherently curious, you mm. know, um, and this is, I, I'm a curious person, too, and when you're, you know, the side things I get interested in, it's... Uh, you, you too know, are a strange and curious idea. person? Yeah, a lot, of, well, a lot of curious people are. They're just, like, full we fall in love with something and it becomes something we'll delve really deeply into for, you know, even up to a couple of years. But then yeah. it's like, well, now I know enough to satisfy my curiosity. Next thing, please. Yeah. That's something I hadn't thought yeah. of actually. Yeah, it, it's, it's true. And you know, the, not all cultures are, are really in, incredibly supportive of that. Fortunately, in New Zealand, we kind of are, but mm. in Germany, you know, they expect that uh, people will work for 20 to 30 years in the same job. And mm. if you change your job off and they're like, well, why did you do that? You can't just say, well, I got bored. Yeah. Um, they think it's deeply weird. You know, <laughs> fortunately, Kiwis, we, we don't think that at all. But, no, no, um, it's yeah, standard. A lot, of, a lot of societies aren't to support you know the inherently curious i wonder and if that you know that's probably why you feel like that i wonder if part of it being more acceptable in new zealand is just the fact that we're a long way away from everyone we've got a smaller population we just don't have the level of kind of specialists to get things done uh so you ah. do get you do have more generalists and you do have more people jumping between jobs because the culture kind of needs it in order to be yes successful or um yeah you know, just to survive really yeah, that's a good point. Actually, we like we like the pe the multifaceted uh, employee that can yeah. you know j jump in and you know quickly fix the fix the website yeah. when they're not. Yeah, don't fun. don't be great at anything. Just be okay at like a bunch of stuff. Okay, yeah, I, I've inherited that from New Zealand. I'm okay mm -hmm. at, in terms of the work market. Yeah. I'm okay at a bunch of stuff, and I'm not really super good at anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know if I quite say I was okay at a bunch of stuff, but I'm like maybe. Slightly above average at a number of yeah, things. Yeah, but you put it like that because you're a Kiwi. Yeah. You're, you're the well, there we go. You're I can't. You're definitely okay at a bunch of stuff, Barney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's where I'm putting the metric for okay, I suppose. Maybe I'm yeah. a bit yeah. high. Uh, but well, seeing as you brought it up, uh, let's talk about let's talk about your painting. Uh, so what I remember actually from back in the day is that. Oh, well, I mean, I had to think about it, but I do remember you drawing a bit. I remember you drew a picture of, like, the band when we were in Bloodflower, like all of us. Ah, the, the face of all of us, did I? Yeah, yeah, it was, like, uh, me, you, George, and Jazz. And, uh, yeah, you had this, like, it was, you know, four pictures of our portraits. And I, 
Um, oh, and I put them together. That's a little bit like Motor- Motorhead used to do that. Now that I think about it, I don't hmm. know if I had that in mind. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I suppose I did know that you that you could draw. I suppose I, I didn't realise until um, we just caught up the other day that it was something that you enjoyed that much. So why don't you tell us about... I'm just amazed by attempted faces because, you know, I know my weaknesses and that's one of them. Oh, I don't do faces. Faces either. are hard. I think <laughs> you actually, you did you did the best job on mine, actually, from memory. Um, yeah. And the others the others did look like faces, but they maybe yeah, didn't. Yeah, they looked like faces. They had eyes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, like, they were in correct proportion and everything, but maybe they didn't, they weren't striking resemblances of uh, Yeah, I doubt they were any good because, seriously, I'm not good at faces. Yeah. Oh, it's... Yeah. it's well, the thing is, the human brain is so geared up to recognize faces, you know, like physiologically, yeah. that it's very yeah. good at detecting things being a bit off, uh, yeah. you know, like millimeters. If you, you know, the, yeah. if the eye is just a millimeter off, it's like, whoa, that's that's not quite right. Whereas if it's a foot, it's like, oh, yeah, it looks like a foot. Um, <laughs> sweet as. But, well, anyway, like, like uh, tell me... Uh, Tell me sort of what got you back into that and uh, how's that going and how you feel about art and drawing and painting and all that. I'm curious. Uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, th- this part's probably not for Kiwi listeners. It's a bit dark. Uh, yeah. how I got into it. Go hard. <laughs> deep, deep trauma. Yeah. <laughs> um, a couple of traumatic experiences coupled with uh, bad relapses in my health. I couldn't do anything really, um, but... And I was really depressed by that, but I found the only thing I could actually do at all, you know, this was including not being able to talk to people, you know, not washing, not feeding myself, nothing. Mm. But I would just, I would just paint things. And it started off with, you know, just painting plants and and nail varnish on the jars that I used to keep things in. And Mm. then, you know, painting paintings and it just soothed me, basically. I noticed that, you know, it gave me that sort of detachment from what, whatever I was feeling at the time. And just that sort of a nice sense of not being there rather than an annihilating yourself feeling of not being there. Mm. It was a pleasant detachment. Um, and I guess from that same experience, uh, I came across, um, well, through a Jungian psychologist, I came across the poems of Rumi. Who, oh, yeah. Um, you mentioned them. Was the actual originator of that, that thing, you know, the cracks are beautiful. It's where the light gets through. Mm. Uh, but we mostly know it from Leonard Cohen. That's right. Um, but... Um, Beef. Yeah, and, he, and that was uh, an indicative of this this style called of art called kitsumi, I think it's called, mm-hmm. where uh, one repairs vases that have broken. It's it's um, I think it's Japanese. Yes. And the idea was that um, you repair it not to hide the fact that it broke and you know make it look as if it, it's new again. Uh, you repair it with gold so that you can see the cracks quite deliberately because. Um, that tells a story about the object's life and, you know, its relation to, to you, its place and so on. Right. Um, and, and of course, this is a nice metaphor for people because, you know, we're all broken in some way and, you know, pull ourselves back together. So we're, we're all also whole. Yeah. But we've got, you know, we've got these cracks in terms of experiences, these scars that, you know, make us, make us who we are. And mm. these, these are the things that form our story. Um, and I don't know if you notice, it's very, it can be very boring to talk to someone who is, you know, either too young to have experienced anything interesting or they've just sort of managed to go through life completely unscathed. And, yeah. you know, they might be nice. They might be good hearted people, but it's like, wow, yeah. I, I just want to, you know, here that's not a problem. You know, tell me your stories about communism. <laughs> yeah. This is unrelatable content. Like, yeah. Just yeah. like unsubscribe. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it, it really hit home with me. It's like, well, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to feel like you're you're a failure as a person because, you know, you've you, you you've been broken and are putting yourself back together. Mm. So this is this is what I, I use a lot of gold in 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 my paintings. I sort of basically take photos of broken glass or broken mirrors or whatever and use that form to, you know, just paint the, the, the gold onto a canvas with nail polish and then I will um choose something that I want to be reconstructed. A lot of it's nature. Um, the, the current one is uh, was inspired by the Morrigan and, and Kali and all of those sort of triple faceted goddesses that are in charge of destruction and rebirth at the same time. Mm-hmm. So um, it's like she's pulled herself back together out of all of the bits of nature to, you know, 
sort of avenge herself on the world, on civilization for doing that to her. Um, so the, that's the current one, but I just really like working with the colors of it. I, I had it, I asked Psyche, this is, this is what Jungian people recommend. You ask Psyche about a certain thing before you go to sleep. And you know, a dream will be delivered that gives you the solution. So, you know, dear Psyche, please send me a dream. What the hell am I here for? Um, and all I remember of the dream was the sentence, um, the only thing that matters is color. <laughs> wow. So Psyche answered my question. Yeah. <laughs> she, I, I love it. I mean, I love it when I remember words from dreams. And I always try and use them in poetry yeah. and stuff as well. They're always important. That's that's the thing. There's something, you know, that your ego is not getting in the way of it either. You know, unless you're saying it in the dream, sometimes it is. But if you just remember these sort of words, whatever falls from the sky or from other characters. Yeah, well, I mean. It's usually it, something that's really worth delving into. And, uh, well, it just feels like you've been delivered something, I think, as well, because you have no conscious yeah. responsibility for generating that sentence or sentences mm. or whatever it might be, those words. Uh, yeah. So it's 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 yeah, like yeah. a divine command. It's like it's dropped out of the sky. Yeah. And then you're like, wow, where'd yeah. this come yeah. from? What do I do with it? Yeah. yeah. How can I yeah. fit it into a poem? Even probably. Guys, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You must use it in yeah. some sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, actually, that reminds me because I I had this happen just coincidentally um, a few nights ago, and I did have a sentence and I wrote it down. And I'll tell you what it is if my phone ever loads. Oh, yeah, good that you're writing them down because it can be so yeah, useful. Yeah, I try to. Um, well, sometimes it's like I'd rather sleep and then, you know, <laughs> it doesn't yeah, happen. Well, you know, yeah, when you get delivered one at two in the morning, you're like, oh, if I write it down, I'll wake up, bugger. Yeah. Uh, it's, my phone's just been kind of a dick. Uh, wait. Uh, stop making noise. Leave me alone. Where'd my bar go? <laughs> Nothing works when you want it to. This is an awesome thing to do in a, in a live stream, isn't it? Look, I've just got to look at my phone. Yeah. Just got to figure some stuff yeah, out. I was just going to say, I have to go to the toilet. <laughs> yeah, go do it. Go do it. I, I'll cut it out. Go, yeah, go. Do this on a live stream? Smash the rim. And, uh, well, the live stream you can't do it. No, they're, they're just, I'll just do a BRB. Okay, everyone listening on the live stream, I'm yeah. just going to try and do this quietly. No, um, you do that. I'm, I'll stick up oh a BRB God. screen and we'll yeah. crack back in. I'll get a drink as well. How's that? Okay, cool. All right, All right. cool. Go. Okay. Okay, See you cool. soon. Bye. Cool. All right, and we're back um, in the in the break. As well as attending to my bodily functions, I, I quickly check the the chat because we're streaming this live. Uh, small crime one six one. And I realise how badly I mangled that word. Yeah, I yeah. I'm never going to try and say that word again. Uh, well, look, I mean, I'm glad it's not only me who ever does that. Uh, but apparently, the the Japanese oh, thing with this uh, kintsugi, kintsugi. I'm probably mispronouncing it now. But uh, Small Crime 161 does say to say greetings to you and Chomsky, who is your dog, I remember that, uh, from your Pol ah, from your Polish oh, friends. Chomsky's like right here next to me, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, oh, hey which, Chomsky. Which one? <laughs> uh, well, that, what, uh, who, I don't know. Just, just all of them, all of all of the Polish friends uh, saying hello. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice that they're here. I, I did live in Poland, but yeah. technically I still sort of live in Poland, so I'm... Yeah, 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 well, that, that's another Moser song. Anthony Stratton. Exactly. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. I did find out. Sorry, there might be more than one. Oh. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So the, the word, the phrase that I had from my dream the other night that I was looking for hmm. was uh, who will be the only passenger tomorrow? <laughs> oh. I know, right? What? It's like, whoa, I've got to use that. That is. Bizarre. I know. Yeah. I know. And also, yeah, passenger is that like is that like the the passive role in something that's driving you well, towards a goal you didn't do, or I mean, is it is it you? Am I the driving? passenger? Am I going along the rails? Yeah, yeah. Are you the passenger, or are you driving? Do I need to change and you've my? Shift all the other people out. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'll work it out in a poem. I'll work yeah, through yeah, it. Yeah, do. I remember a, a quote that I always liked from Bill Manhire was, um, "Poetry is how we." And tie ourselves from the knots that we tie ourselves into or I mean, oh, wow. it, that's paraphrasing but it's you know <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, that was um Yeah, that's beautiful. I know, that's not no. Yeah. Um I think I think that applies to a lots of art forms too. That's really mm. lovely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, certainly not limited to poetry, but I, I suppose yeah. you know that was his experience of it. That's, that's his, yeah, yeah. I imagine that's true for you of well, songs particularly. You know, because oh, yeah. I've known from reading your lyrics that it's often like you've obviously had some thoughts about some particular thing, and you're you're working through what you think about it and how you feel about it. At least lyrically. Yeah, and and because you you know a lot of my history, eh? There's sometimes mm. I look at albums a few years later and go. Oh my God! Now it's so flaming obvious what was what was eating me, but at the yeah. time I, I didn't even know that's what was eating me. So, and, yeah. See, that's a problem with interpretation of literature too that I've read about. That mm-hmm. uh, often what the artist thinks that they're say in this case writing about, uh, they could yeah. be they could look at the poem twenty years later and say, no, that's that's not what I was writing about at, at all. You know, I don't understand that really what I was trying to grapple with or thinking about was this. And I just didn't have the awareness or the capacity yeah. for self-reflection at the time. Um, and that's exactly true, eh? And you do an interview shortly after writing it, and you say it's about this. Mm. And then years later, you're like, oh, God, no, I was just using that as a metaphor. That's actually a totally obvious parallel for this other thing mm. that was going on. Um, wow. So, yeah. The, the, cum- the human capacity for self-deception is, is limitless. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. God, yeah. It's a talent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what we can use it for. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, not driving ourselves mad every moment of every day, I suppose, yeah. with too much truth. Well, I mean, uh, you made a reference, uh, maybe not on the stream or maybe before, we, uh, when you were talking about you know the fish saying, what is water, right? And that's from David yeah. Foster Wallace's speech. But if you... Yeah, it's, it's a famous one, eh? Yeah, that's right. And, and if... But everyone expects a fish would know about water, but it's such no. a part of their own environment that, that they yeah. don't. What's water? Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you look into that guy, I mean, really, he just had this boggling level of self-awareness that destroyed him. Like it just, it, it was, it was horrific. Like if you actually read him talking about the the way he thinks and the way he looks at things, just constant mm-hmm. self-criticism and self-reflection, and also being able to apply a lens like that to everybody else. I mean, one thing that you often notice yeah. about writers is that they're great with details and often also very good with psychology. Same thing, characters, yeah. you know, and uh, understanding yeah. people's motivation. And he just had that light dialed up to 11, and it made him so miserable, like so unbelievably depressed. And uh, I, I think to answer your question, that would be my theory about why why we protect ourselves from too much self-awareness or self-knowledge or understanding of the world, because it yeah, could easily dry us mad. Jungian psychologists say as well, particularly about working with dreams that... Um, mm these things are actually only shown to us uh, in metaphor, at fir- you know, first of all, to sort of couch things a little in case you're not ready for them. Mm. And that, you know, often it won't deliver us any sort of anything that's an insight into something we're not re- yet ready to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a, their perspective on it, that you, you won't have any insight into the things that are, are far too hard to deal with at the moment until you've gone over, you know, the hurdles leading up to that, mm. so to speak. Yeah. Well, actually, um, you keep bringing up Jungian psychology, so I'm going to pick you up on it. And uh, yeah. what's your what's your interest in that? How have you sort of encountered it? Um, oh, you know? I've, I've been interested since oh late teenagers, but then I sort of you know didn't read much of it and then get back into it repeatedly. Uh, I just I basically got back into it again a couple of years ago and found it found it really really helpful because there is the the sort of wonderful uh scope for for um experiencing your own life symbolically and metaphorically yeah um which gives you an element of you know that sort of very zen of detachment where you you know you're looking at things as as symbols including your own experiences as symbolic which uh makes you less I, i guess makes the sometimes negative feelings attached to them a lot less you know biting um, right. And also, it makes basically everything a lot more beautiful and poetic when you when you look at it symbolically. Because uh, I deal a lot in archetypes and narratives, and um, the whole idea of you know the dream, the dream realm being um, messages from the subconscious. And of course, Jung goes a bit further than that into the the sort of the level below your own subconscious.
subconscious, which is, you know, when you dream, your subconscious sending you messages, messages from you to you sort of thing mm -hmm. in symbol and metaphor form. But then he goes a step deeper and says there's also this universal subconscious. That yeah. All of the subconsciouses are sort of, you know, intertwined, joined in some way. And, that, you know, now and again, when prophetic dreams come, they're very rare, according to Jungian psychologists, but, you know, that's where they come from. The sort of realm where we're all in some sort of not not rational way joined, but um, mm. the symbols will bubble up there. Um, yeah, I, so I, I, I find it nice a nice way of looking at it because it does also you know prevent you from going further than you're ready to go, but it will show you your dreams are you know allegedly you know will show you something that you do not yet know. So mm. you're making progress without it being hideously cathartic. <laughs> you know, or right. it can be, of course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I had a, an initial sort of interest, probably around the same time that you said you you were, but um, you first became interested in Jungian psychology. But I think the thing that initially put me off was the uh, was that collective subconscious idea, because me too. Yeah, because I was like, ah, oh, that be bullshit. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's but, just but like that. Remember us at that age. Yeah, right. We were teenagers from extremely rational families where the yes. only thing that counted was scientific fact. You know, no. so of course we were, we were sort of shaped to think. And I remember thinking that. So, oh, this guy was cool until he got with the weird esoteric bullshit. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My dad's a scientist. <laughs> so what was I going to think? <laughs> well, it's maybe a little bit different for me because um, although both my teachers were in, uh, both my teachers, both my parents were, were teachers. So I'm quite a sort of rational yeah. uh, profession. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They were also both religious in different ways. So, I had been, ah. I had sort of been exposed to that, but I suppose at that age, I'd, I'd really rejected it. Uh, I was going to say you'd have an aversion then, Rhett, more yeah, yeah, than I, anything else. That's like, right. The religious realm has not served me well. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, more or less, more or less. And I, I think since I've kind of eased up on that, I mean, I'd still describe myself as, as an atheist, but I'm not religious about it. And uh, mm. I... I suppose there's a there's a. That's funny. I know. That's why I like to say it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> some, some atheists really are quite religious, you know, and I. I... Oh, that some of them are vehemently. They they preach. They preach yeah, atheism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they they do, <laughs> and have all the same kind of you know, schizotypal uh, um, thought processes yeah, that you often um, see in very religious people. Uh, yeah, dogmatic dogmatism they have yeah. as well. It's like, well, yeah. yeah, that's right. And I suppose within the first few years, I've kind of encountered Jungian psychology again, and I'm I'm looking at it differently. I'm looking at more the way in which I used to be exposed to uh, metaphorical and symbolic interpretations of the Bible when I was a kid, um, ah, and yeah. and and looking at the way that it does that, but with um, you know not just the Bible with with ourselves, with other people, with literature, with yeah, society, with and stuff like that. Of so many different cultures. Yeah, yeah. and and being oh, happy to I just take what I like. Sorry, yeah, Sadie. Yeah, exactly. Can I? And also, oh, also the symbols are, are very, very personal too. So mm. you, you, you'd be more likely than I, for example, to have have dreams that are metaphors from the Bible. You know, that have a personal significance for you. Mm. It might be quite apart from the Bible significance, depending on whether a parent read it to you when you're a child and things like that. Right. But, uh, yeah, I want to make a podcast recommendation. Oh yeah, go um, ahead. For for you as well as anyone who's interested in this. Right. It's called this this Jungian life. And um, it's thisjungianlife.com or .org. It's um, three Jungian analysts okay. in the States. And the, I'll, I'll put it in the about thing for the podcast afterwards yeah, so people can go check yeah. it out. Yeah, and um, they're, they're already quite well known, but they, okay. they always do a theme, um, which they will sort of, you know, do a, a deep dive into, and then they'll do a dream analysis. Oh. It's really interesting to see how they will often a lot of them you know have read whether they've read ayurvedic myths vedic myths or, or greek myths or whatever or just you know the, the european ones they will they'll come up with the symbologies of those in their in their analysis process and yeah it's just it's just really intriguing so anyone who likes the fact that i'm crapping on about this <laughs> this Jungian life it's, it's great okay brilliant um i'll, I'll check it out myself yeah, um, I, that's kind of what I'm, mostly I'm recommending to you of you because I think you find it really cool. Yeah. I also recommend other resources and the podcasts and lectures and things. Do you own a copy of the Red Book? Uh, no, because I want to get it in German. Ah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I haven't. Not in stinky English. Expensive, yeah. But of course, and uh, actually, there's, I think, on Scribed, 
someone reads the red book or there is or is it no this the red book is on scribed in english mm. yeah um but you know that the family really didn't want it put out this is why i yeah. to read it actually they didn't want to put out because they thought that, you know, he'd basically be tipped as a nutcase and too esoteric and all those things that critics of Young, Young will always say. Oh, I mean, um, it's a beautiful book. Have you read it? Or- uh, sort of. <laughs> I've skimmed it yeah. and I've looked at the pictures. <laughs> um, he was amazingly oh, no, good as an artist. He was. He I really was. Stuff, I thought, fuck, that's his second fiddle and he's so good. I, get- I know. Bastard. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, well, tell me what you read. Um, well, honestly, I, a friend of mine, I think it came out, and I could be wrong, but I think it came out in 2009. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously a long time. Um, yeah. Because it was, uh, I guess, suppressed, uh, presumably by the family or whatever, for so long. It but was, a, friend, yeah, a, a friend of mine bought it, um, and he let me, you know, a beautiful book, uh, and he let me look at it, and... Um, I remember very little, except the pictures. I do remember the pictures were amazing because they're just so yeah, full of yeah. symbols and they, they make you feel uh, they make you feel like you're a kid when you look into a book that you're not meant to be looking into and you kind of know yeah. it for some reason, but you don't really understand it either. They, and, and it's also got that arc- arcane sort of overtone to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. just like, this is yeah. a world that I'm not sure I'm allowed to delve into. Yeah, you know? that's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, cool. Um, so maybe I'll go and have a look at that again too, seeing as I apparently yeah, remember nothing it, yeah. from it except for the, the cool pictures. Yeah. Too, yeah. yeah, too much time reading comics. <laughs> I was too entranced by the cool pictures. <laughs> yeah, the cool pictures. <laughs> Young, do it for the cool pictures. Yeah, the only thing that matters is colour. I have yeah. a good authority. <laughs> well, and it's you know very strongly coloured too, like uh, striking. Yeah. yeah, I love his use of colour and, and methods. Yeah, it's cool. So I don't know. I don't like circles. I know he's a big one for the mandalas and draw, I, I like spirals, but it might be overexposure to the koru. Uh, <laughs> I, I like, I like yeah, hard, hard to avoid and hard to uh, avoid here, even if you wanted to. Um, yeah, yeah. Now, now when people say spiral, I just think of purity spirals and <laughs> people, people just what like. Well, it, it's more or less um, when people collapse under their own desire to be believed to be correct in what they're doing. You know, and and the fear that they're kind oh, you of just cut out. Well, well, no, as in, as in like yeah. you you think you've said something wrong or incorrect that people are going to judge you from, and then you just collapse inwardly in the spiral of uh-huh. uh, shame and guilt and uh, self criticism oh. and uh, second guessing, and you know that, that's how I understand it anyway. But I came across the phrase somewhere, and uh, and I've seen a few people go into purity spirals. Uh, yeah. So. so wow. um, so now that's my association with the word. Um, that's a grim association. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is rather. That's, that's the thing. If you dream of a spiral, it's yeah. got a definite, un- different meaning to if I yes. dream of a spiral. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Same for, well, any other kind of shape or something. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you saying that you wanted that uh, book in German does lead me yeah. onto our next topic. Which is language, and oh, language. among among the many strings to your bow, Jordan, uh, I feel like you speak about a million languages quite well, <laughs> or, I, I, or very well in some cases. <laughs> Might as well be a million, yeah. probably average yeah. for a European, but for a Kiwi, it's like wow, this really. Is, you meet you meet so many Europeans, especially the Swedes. Somehow they've just all got like you know, just name a language and they speak it. It's weird, yeah. and deflating. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, every well, Swede I've ever run into, it, at least, well, yeah, usually we'll speak English completely fluently, and yeah. then maybe uh, probably like German, French as well, and yeah, maybe some other stuff. Yeah, maybe like some related Scandinavian languages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I realise they don't go in for the Slavic languages a lot, and and I know why. They're just extremely fucking difficult. Um, and that's the yeah, thing I yeah. noticed with Polish because. Uh, and in Germany, I turned up in Germany in 2003, the first time right. I couldn't speak German. Um, and it took me about two years to get fluent. And, you know, that was with the effort of making people not speak English to me because they all want to. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They want to practice their English. Yeah. And no, you're not helping. Yourself. 
I, I actually a few times said the official language in New Zealand is Maori. I don't speak English. <laughs> <laughs> you said that in German. Someone believe me. Someone oh, nice. Yeah, funny. Well played. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I noticed after two years of learning Polish, um, what the what I could do by that stage was cry about the fact that I couldn't do anything and think that I'd wasted two years of my life. <laughs> oh, man. And then, and then well, fuck it. I've invested two years in this. I just have to keep going because otherwise it is a waste. Yeah, um, yeah. And then eventually it just it just started clicking. But the, they've got, you know, they've got seven cases and oh. uh, everything. And, um, oh. yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, the Germans, you know, have four and English has the decency to just have two. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Uh, it... the, the thing I noticed about it, which is I think why I fall in love with languages, is um, – Remember that we heard in school in like the 80s and 90s, you know, oh, why should people be learning Māori? Because, you know, it's pointless. Mm. And um, I remember hearing arguments that were actually incredibly sound, but as a kid, you don't get it. Like, um, right. this is, you know, it's another way of seeing the world. It divides the world up differently. It, you know, it's yeah. like wearing a different yeah, set of glasses, the, the, the kind of value systems that come forth. Um, you know, are, are different, and you get this whole other way of looking at the world, which you know even now sounds a bit esoteric. But here's some science for you. Mm -hmm. um, neurology talks about the fact that um, uh, you know the, the neurons that fire together wire together. Most people know that, but you know it's about use. If you want to change the way you're thinking, is the other thing. Mm -hmm. You have to um, somehow get the neurons to fire differently so that you don't fall back into your, you know, in my case, negative thought circles. Right. Um, and I found it very, very useful. Speaking foreign languages, there are a lot of things that you cannot directly translate so you have to make a choice how am I going to phrase this because this there is no way to directly translate this I'm going to either slant it slightly more positively slightly more negatively or whatever axis it goes on right um, so you are literally firing other new neurons because you're describing the same event in a, in a way that's actually slightly different um, and the fact that language does actually structure your thought because, you know, certain modes of expression are available or not, or, you know, there's lots more colors in this way and less in this one. Right. Um, you end up thinking differently. And um, for me, it's just really helped because you know, a lot of the things that, you know, the, the crappy stuff that's happened in, in my life, you know, were in my English speaking sort of years and um, going to another place and articulating everything in a language that was, you know, different for me and clunky at first um you have to express it differently and then when you start to think in the language you also recall things somehow differently and i just found that so helpful um and to, to this day when, when germans try and speak english with me i will, I will refuse like a stubborn incredibly you know impolite person yeah but that's the reason um i don't want to fall back into those thought habits and i find it you know it really helps keep them at bay speaking another language um it's also really good for alzheimer's apparently because yeah you know, you yeah cognitive reserve don't, you don't usually fire yeah 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 i mean so um that's what I dig about it. well yeah one of the thing with with alzheimer's and and so on is that uh this they talk about cognitive reserve so basically that the more the more the more stuff you know the more stuff your brain's busy knowing and doing and being able to do uh, once it starts to erode and you lose it, the more of there is to lose, basically, until you become not very functional. Yeah. Uh, and and I mean languages because of it, it you know what what learning a language does to your brain, um, the, just the increased capacity and, and um, knowledge. I mean even just learning a basic vocabulary of a language is like you've just learned three thousand things, <laughs> like yeah. literally, right? Uh, and yeah, connected yeah. them together, and you know that's that's quite a lot of cognitive reserve that has to be got through before you you start to really become kind of non-functional. So um, mm, you know, yeah. get out there and learn stuff uh, if you don't want to be. Well, especially if you feel like you might be um, at any risk of um, dementia or something. Yeah, yeah. But that's what? what... And that's the thing. But it has to be used. This is the thing. It has yeah, to be yeah. Active. And um, this the advantage of living on the border, right? So I live on a town that's yeah, got two names. That's so cool. Yeah. I, find, I find that so cool too. I have to 
constantly explain my uh, the ecstasy <laughs> of like I can walk I can walk for five minutes and be in another country. Yeah. For a Kiwi, you know what that's like. Hey, oh yeah, going like, to Europe, it's like man, this is so great. And this and it's so completely cool. different. Everyone speaks a different language. Yeah. There's completely it's like, different I'm, stuff. I'm I'm going to buy my groceries in Poland now, and that's yeah. really what happens. <laughs> so you get you speak Polish, you know, yeah. when you're on that side. Or I speak it most of the time because our old woman with dogs club is mostly Poles. Right. Um, but so you're swapping between between German and Polish the whole time. A lot of people here, you know, Europeans, they speak more languages than we do. It's mm. Polish, German, and Czech because we're also on the Czech border. It's just a bit further away. Right. Uh, you've got this constant, this constant, you know, set of quite different neurons firing, and um, yeah, I just find it, I find it really refreshing, and it does, it does break you out of those, those ways of seeing the world that have done you a disservice for so long. Can you, you can know? you think of like examples, like sort of concrete examples of of the way in which that happens, or the way that you might think oh, differently yeah. in different languages? Yeah, it's hard to actually because I only noticed it after it started happening, and that. Um, there are just certain expressions that, uh, well, German is an example. You can be a hell of a lot more direct and no one considers it rude. Yeah, right. Um, but, you know, if you've come from a culture where, um, oh, as an example, I had some business uh, students when I was teaching English in Hamburg mm. and we we're doing meetings with, with British nationals and they want to negotiate stuff. And so, you know, the example of Brit comes in with an idea that's, you know, pretty crap. And, you know, what do you say? Yeah. And, one of the German guys would say, I just say, this is not a very good idea. And I always <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, <laughs> why not? And he's like, well, I said, well. That's so German. And he's like, so what should I say? And I said, in English, we would say, oh, you know, perhaps we should possibly consider what other options are on the table before. And he, he just threw his fist down on the table. <laughs> <laughs> all of these words just to say that this is a very bad idea <laughs> Correct. And, uh, so I find myself able to say you know when something is is just you know f obviously as a Kiwi to say I just don't like this we're already quite pissed off <laughs> yeah and yeah that's right like the you're, you're like the third level of pissed off by the time you're yeah, we're say something like that. pissed off just to say I think this is not a good idea so, and just just being able to say that, and um, you know, because we bottle up anything negative in New Zealand, mm. and here I'm actually able to, um, you know, just just get that out. It's gone. It doesn't rattle around in my head anymore. I just say, you know, this is a crap idea, mm. you know, to a friend, and they just say, oh yeah, okay, well let's think of something else. And you're like, wow, I didn't ruin my friendship. So there yeah, goes right. my constant worry. If I say the wrong thing, my friends won't like me. They'll think I'm an asshole. So yeah. these things stop rattling around in your head because you're like, well, I can just say I think this is a crap idea, <laughs> and and we move on. Um, so I guess that's a concrete example. Yeah, there. I mean, I, I have some German friends, and uh, I've had interactions with them where, okay, I mean, the way that they were speaking, like, I know that they're German, so it's okay, but if I were to speak like that, I would feel like I would be incredibly rude. Uh, but also, yeah, yeah. and when, when I'm trying to, you know, like, nut things out with them and figure stuff out, um, yeah. if I express myself in a way that, that here would be incredibly rude, that they respond just yeah. like you say. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, you're right. That's a crap idea. Yeah. Um, let's yeah. try this then. And I'm like, wow, yeah. really? <laughs> yeah, wow, you can, really. You can just talk like that? Yeah. And it's okay. Yeah, yeah. You can just say that. And at, at we're first, still friends. Uh, yeah, we're still friends. Exactly. Mm. And this is the other thing. We in, in New Zealand we do, um, and the Brits do this terribly as well. It's just mm. we must say everything. You know, we've, we take them to. We, we assume everyone is some kind of total emotional cripple, and that yeah. if we say anything a halfway interpretable is offensive. They're going to fall to pieces in front yes. of us. They'll definitely never be our friend because we've destroyed them and we're an arsehole because we've done right. this deliberately. Yes. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, um, this is one of the worries that we, you know, repeat to ourselves. I'm a terrible person. I said a terrible thing. We over, yeah. we over monitor what we're saying. And we drink um, too much too. So actually there's a, a reasonable chance that at some point while drunk, yeah, that you will say that something. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but here it's like that thought you can you can sort of get rid of that one a bit mm. as well. And and with the polls, it was like you know, oh god, I'm being a negative creep today because you know I've, I've really had a shit day and I've just blurted out all of the details. Yes. And you know, then then they'll tell you some some you know absolutely awful story about you know that 
the time under the curfew and, you know, they'll go on for hours. And, and you realise that what you said has in no way got them down or anything. That's just part of life. And, you know, you can drop that one too. So it's it's these ways of seeing the world and these sort of value systems of what, you know, what they consider polite or, or too dark or whatever. And you can, you you learn that the feedback is, is different when you act in those ways and you can sort of accept yourself a bit more readily. And you see it, you see it embedded in the language as well as the culture. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is Cause there's yeah. something called the, uh, I'll see if I remember this correctly. I think it's the sapir wharf hypothesis, which is, uh, well, the strong form of the hypothesis, I think, is basically what you've said in a way that um, we frame the world to a degree, well, to a greater or lesser degree, um, with the language that we use, that we learn to describe it. So basically the yeah. world genuinely looks different and is interpreted differently based on what your, I suppose, mother tongue is. Um, yes. So yeah. that's the strong okay. form of the hypothesis, and then there are weaker forms, and then there are people who kind of reject it entirely. Um, mm. But, yeah, I mean, that, that's one I've, I've come across a few times. Um, I'm not sure if it's more I of a... I agree with it from, from living in the culture. Yeah. I don't know what it's like if you learn a language, because, you know, theoretically you could, you could learn, let's say, Polish or German or, what, or whatever, yeah. and speak it in, you know, in New Zealand with a bunch of other people who actually might be you know, Polish or German or, or with mm. friends who are also Kiwis that speak that language. And it's, you know, whilst the whilst there are different ways of articulating things, you won't get the cultural um, aspect of it where, you know, you notice that no one's offended when you say this is a shit idea. Right, right. So, yeah, so, I mean, that, that's... speaking German. So that would clearly be like a cultural component, but I suppose the yeah. sapir wolf hypothesis would be talking about things like, for example, um, I know that there's at least one culture that doesn't have numbers. Um, oh, wow. So, so yeah, they will, they will talk. As well. Yeah, exactly. In fact, we're yeah, probably thinking, we're probably that. thinking of the same one. Um, uh, but I, I know, yeah. I know that they would talk about, you know, there are basically the equivalent of saying there is one, there are some, there are many, and you know mm. that's that's about it in terms of dealing yeah. with quantities. And if you think about mm. how that just affects your ability to even describe the world, or like you said, if there's only the present tense in your language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they have this beautiful uh, in that language. They have this uh, this beautiful way of talking about uh, someone coming and going, and and it's the same kind of way that they describe the way that a candle flickers. Basically, someone just approaches into your consciousness and exits it. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's the same sort of phrase or description as you used to describe a flickering candle, because they're they're that in the present. Um, they also don't have a creation myth, which is uh, extremely unusual yeah. for a group of people. But anyway. I'm thinking, uh, thinking too just of how, how it would shape your world. I, I'll bet you anything mm. that um, people whose mother tongue is there are a nightmare for the tax department. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a so sort of remote many, Amazon. How many bikes did you sell? Uh, some? <laughs> yeah. I, I... How much profit did you make? <laughs> some? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made one profit. Or yeah. mini profit. Yeah, I made one profit yeah. <laughs> but I imagine those things wouldn't even concern you. No. Right? Like, well, you know, it's good. Some is good. Yeah, I, I, about? <laughs> I think it's a kind of it's an Amazon tribe who's quite remote, and I don't think they have yeah. much contact. I mean, I very, yeah, I very much doubt crazy. they have to fill in. No, I mean, culture centric here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't think they have to fill in tax forms yet. I could yeah, be yeah. wrong. <laughs> I could be wrong. I'm. Uh, I know it's because I mean, well, it's interesting too that your dog is called Chomsky, um, because <laughs> because uh, this culture was looked at as an example of one that um, refuted his hypothesis about certain aspects of language, uh, Chomsky's sort of hypothesis. Uh, oh, but it, yeah. oh, um, oh, taxing my memory now. Um, I need to go back and read about this some more. No, no doubt there are people shouting at me in the comments. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, Chomsky had a, uh, I think it was the one about the, the reflexivity and permutability of language that uh -huh. in their culture, you, you don't actually have that. Whereas he said this would be standard across all cultures because every language that we'd encountered uh -huh. up to that point uh, had had this quality yeah. and then theirs didn't. And then I yeah. think he kind of defended it even when it was pointed out by being like, well, it's kind of like um, if you said... Uh, you know, humans are bipeds who walk on two legs and you came across some sort of culture where 
nobody did. Uh, you know, it doesn't actually really refute the statement, or well, that was his sort of attempted counter to it, but okay. I'm probably getting like five things wrong in that description. Yeah, so go. I should oh, have look. Chomsky so long after I'd read him. Um, yeah. so he, and, and I don't know if I'm remembering this rightly or wrongly, but um, I'm not sure that he speaks another language. And I always find this a little bit, a little bit suspect because I know. Chomsky. From my time. Yeah. Uh, I do know, I do know the answer to that question. Um, do you? He he can certainly understand uh, other European languages. I don't see like there, there's a there's a really interesting video where he has a um, he has a debate with um, Foucault, and uh, Foucault talks entirely in French, and Chomsky is like totally follows him the whole time, and he he actually says you know when he's traveling the world just you know give me any paper written in in a European language. But he wouldn't. He would say himself, "Oh no, no, I don't speak." Blah blah blah. But I think his yeah. thing is he basically has had enough exposure to the languages and contact with them that if other people speak it or write it, he can pretty much, you know, figure out what the root words are and, and uh, understand what's being said. So That's he's sort amazing. of yeah, I know, I know, and he's so modest about That's it. But I know oh, I don't yeah. speak it. He's taught. He's actually taught some papers, I think, and maybe French. And but he kind of like, oh well, yeah. I mean, I taught this in French, but. It was just a technical paper, yeah. blah blah blah. It's very yeah, um, yeah. Dismissive. I do not. I do notice a difference though between um, the the sort of active and passive uses of language. Because um, mm -hmm. you know, as English speakers, there's certain things we will encounter that are English family, and you know, we do get a fairly quickly quick understanding of um, uh, languages. Like in, in Holland, I was there once, so it's a sort of mix between German and English. If you read the newspaper. Yeah. You can understand it, yeah. um, but there's no way in the world that I could. My brain was sort of actively form a sentence to articulate my feeling, state of being, or anything that yes. I needed yeah, in exactly. that language. Um, it's quite a different act. Um, yeah. But you know, I'm I'm not sure how to articulate the insights that 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 gives you or not. But I notice it's a very different thing to 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 wield a language to mm. have to sort of you know be inside a culture that wields it and and find your place there in an active usage sense um, yeah. and just being able to read it sort of, yes, it's more of an observer. I guess that makes you more objective, one could argue, but um, I don't know. I, I find the benefits that I experience from, you know, the, the, the neural stuff where I don't repeat the same thoughts over again come from actively using it rather than passively oh, yeah. understanding it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've had a limited amount of um, study of French and so on, and I've certainly found that. Like, there was a period where I was trying to learn really hard all the time, and I just, I just started to basically break into that. You know, anyone who's learned language will know what I'm talking about. You break into that region where you can start to express your thoughts reasonably rapidly. Like, you can, you know, think, okay, that's how I'd say it in French, and then just express it. And you might not get it completely right, but you can basically get the ball over the net to someone you're trying to communicate with. And it just feels like it's yeah, just kind it of flowering. Great it's so cool, that feeling. <laughs> yeah, it's a great feeling. Unfortunately, then I, yeah. for whatever reason, stopped. And now I'm back to where I was, which is, again, you know, if I'm, if I'm listening to French or if I'm reading it, I can more or less make sense of it. But it, I would struggle to have a conversation, you know, even quite a simple one. Um, yeah, and actually, met yeah. someone. So. That's a, that's a shame in New Zealand. Uh, is Maori being taught in schools now? Uh, the latest government is actually pushing for it. The latest government is pushing for Good. it to become compulsory. So Good. it may happen. It may happen. Yeah, that's that's we we really need to because it's you know it's so difficult to to go on your Polynesian languages would also be you know a good start because we just don't get that aspect of you know it's a joy of existence. Yeah, <laughs> meeting other cultures and other languages and seeing things that way. Yeah, and and I think yeah. a lot a lot yeah, of their cultural people right there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no excuse. Yeah. Um, and a lot of their kind of cultural beliefs and norms and stuff are really quite embedded in their in their language. Um, yes, yes, um, exactly. Yeah. And I think it, even just for, I guess, uh, cultural relations within the country, I think it would really be mm -hmm. uh, a good idea yeah. because it, it would Absolutely. force you to start to think of the world somewhat differently. Um, you know, and, and also it's um, it's really bound with the land that, you know, the European English speakers also live in. So, you know, imagine mm. being able to see your own you know, physical environment differently. You know, here I'm a visitor. I'm seeing, you know, a, a country I did not grow up in. 
you know, yeah. a different, you know, through my English eyes, English speaking eyes, obviously, and but also theirs. But with Maori, it's it's actually the place you live as well. Mm. So, you know, it's an extra gift. Yeah, and you might not hear it much kind of walking around, but if you would not have to make much effort to actually uh, encounter people to speak it with and so on, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Versus it probably being just about impossible to do in Europe or UK or America. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I get you're you've done too many things, Jordan. I'm just looking at this list, and there's like there's all this stuff that yeah, me feel good here. Uh, like there's there's all this stuff that I actually know you know a lot about and could talk about. I know and could talk about to an incredible extent that we haven't even touched on. Um, and I'll man, I'll, I'll save some of these actually. Uh, well, okay, so something that I don't know how many people know about you, but well, uh, okay, no, let's let's approach this more generally. Um, you you've actually you've got quite a few qualifications in uh different things correct yeah, they're not they're not that uh, nothing where i had to like study for a math uh, thing for time, but they're, they're, um, the same trouble as you. yeah i have the same trouble as you finishing qualifications well um so let's kind of look at that a little bit i mean the the first one well I, Let's go through your educational history. How about that? And and look at oh, look at God, the things that you've done. So what? It, yes, I think so. I, because I know that there's probably some stuff you've done that I can't even remember. Well, what was the what was the what was the like after you finished high school, secondary school? Mm -hmm. uh, what was the first thing you went and did after that? Yeah, a teacher's college thing that I didn't finish because I realised that I am terrified by children. Yeah, a lot of people do that actually. They start on degrees that like they'll learn all the stuff, but when it comes yeah. to actually implementing it, like and deal with people, um, yeah. it's like, oh well, shit, this is not what I'm about at all. Can we go back to the books? Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me do the theory and yeah. not like deal with this real world stuff. I'll, I'll do yeah. tests, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Just yeah. get those kids away from me. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually I like kids, but only in like small numbers. Like a whole classroom full of kids to me is terrifying, and I do have some experience in those environments. And it's just oh man. Oh, have you, have you taught kids as well? Um, yeah, sort of, sort of. Um, in, I mean, in smaller groups, but I would often have to be in a full classroom environment. And of course, you know, everyone looks at you when you walk in, look weird. And kids don't have much in terms of filters, so they just say a whole bunch of mean, weird stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, they do. And in smaller groups, they don't quite have the confidence to, to treat you mm. that way, and so it was uh, I'd get on better with them. I mean, I'd probably do a bit of, yeah, and just, just the idea of keeping control of a group of 20 or 30 kids. I mean, I don't know. I'm impressed by people who do it, like my sister and parents and yeah. so on. But, but anyway, so you did that. That didn't work out. Was that when I met you then, that you started at the... The diploma. Oh, no, no, this is this is the thing. I think this is the part you may not know about my educational and in inverted commas history. Yeah, carry on. It was me starting starting and not finishing a million things because I basically had no idea who I was. Yeah. Oh, carry on. <laughs> so I, I literally chose teachers college because um the first guy I ever went out with who I thought was wonderful, mm. um, his sister was like this like really strong female character and, and I just really admired her and I was like, Oh, Shelly Harpy, she's a teacher, I'll do that. I like her. Mm. <laughs> she's a good role model. Good reason as any. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, a bit random. Mm. And then then I did a year of studying, um this is I feel so embarrassed to admit this. Um I thought I was going to be studying basically insects and plants, so you know, enrolled in botany things and that sort yeah. of. But I had no idea what the word anth anthropology was. I thought I was studying arthropods. <laughs> oh. But partly because the code is just A N T H, and I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. because I showed up really late. I was, I was already late, so I had to take a choice of stuff that was available. And I quickly looked through it. It's like, yeah, bio, bio, that's cool. Um, and A N T H. Arthropods, okay, I can handle insects. <laughs> yeah, awesome. <laughs> so I did some anthropology. I said, like, oh, okay, uh, this is actually very interesting, which got me into sociology. Oh, this is really interesting. And um, then I decided to, that I wanted to be in a rock band. <laughs> yeah. So how, how, how long did you do those things before <laughs> deciding you want to be in a rock band? Uh, I did a year of T-Col and then I did a year of um, that right. random mix of, of various things, sociology, anthropology. And, and then you went in and decided you were going to be in a rock band. Did, how, did, 
Yeah. How many years of that course did you do? Did you finish it? Uh, no, I didn't finish it because, you know, apparently I wasn't nearly as good as the other singers. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, they were, wasn't... they were mostly involved in very different styles. Um, yeah, very think. different styles. And I was, I was always very insecure about, yeah. you know, whether I was good enough. And actually, I did, I, the breakthrough moment I had concerning that, I'm going to share it because I hope that it will help other musicians because I think we all think, oh, my God, I'm not good enough, blah, blah, blah. Mm. So um, this is all the way in 2009. Um, and I was doing online shows. Well, I wasn't yet. A friend of mine who I had been homeless with, we were street musicians together. And we'd both found places in Hamburg. And she'd start doing these online shows. And I was like, well, what the hell is this? And she said, oh, I'll show you. So she had an avatar. And, you know, she showed me the screen. She's got this avatar that's moving. She's got, you know, a bit of kit there streaming the music that she's playing live. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is really cool. And, you know, they're, they're throwing her Linden dollars. This is called Second Life. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I remember. Like, oh, uh, that, that's really cool. And she's, yeah, and you can cash them out to actual money. I'm like, <sighs> Jesus. Um, but I thought, well, you know, she's really good. You know, I can't do this. And then she said, oh, we'll go and, we'll go and watch this other gig when she was finished. So I turn up at this gig, and um, there's this guy there, and – you know, in terms of, you know, music is all the taste thing, personal taste. I show up and I'm like, Christ, this guy is just abominable. Right. And just technically you know, all the bad. Things come in and you're like, he's, he's crap. Instead yeah. of saying, you know, I just don't like this music. I literally thought this guy's crap. Yeah. And I saw how much money was being thrown at him. And I was like, well, okay, whether or not he's any good. It is obviously an irrelevant question. It might li literally be just a matter of taste because these people love him. And they literally right. did. And they yeah, put yeah. in tons of money. And it was just like this epiphany for me. It's like, yeah, you saying he's crap, there's you know, there's no truth about art. There's no he's not crap. He's neither crap nor good. He's just what he is. Mm. And a lot of people love it. So the question of whether I'm good or not is so irrelevant. There's always going to be people that love you. No yeah. matter, you know, how crap you might think you are or how others, how crap others might think you are, uh, like I was horribly to that poor man. Um, <laughs> and then I let go of the question. And that, that was a super important thing to do mm. for me. So, you know, musicians out there, just stop asking that question. Just yeah. do it. Yeah, that's There's right. There's always going to be people that like it. Uh, I mean, that's exactly true. And and I think often as as artists or musicians, people often focus on things that, don't really relate to what people find interesting or attractive about them. So, you know, if you're mm -hmm. singing, maybe, oh, well, I can't pull off, you know, that melismata in the soprano range or something. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, I'm not as good as this person because I can't do that. And it's like that, that has yeah. nothing to do with whether or not people are going to enjoy, you know, listening to music, seeing you perform yeah. or whatever. You, you did right. And they engage on so many, you know, and, and you notice this about how, you know, we engage with music as musicians. You'll engage on a number of levels, whether it be how they construct melody, whether it's their tech. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I love Bob Dylan. And everyone told me years later, oh, the guy can't sing. It's like, I literally never noticed. I like his well, voice because yeah, his it's, lyrics are beautiful. <laughs> yeah, his lyrics are amazing. And I actually think yeah. his voice gets too much shit because it's quite nasal, but he is singing in tune. You know, yeah, and who cares? Yeah, he's. I literally don't care. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm it's just Terry Farrell, who we both love. Oh yeah, you were there. Big day out where he did not actually hit any single note. <laughs> it yeah. was amazing. Just, was just, just like, dump the re oh, I, well, and I think a lot of people who've done gigs know that that can just happen too. I mean, yeah, exactly. it, maybe if you're really. <laughs> you just can't hear yourself very well, or you can't hear the backing music, and you're just pitching off some imaginary yeah. notes that aren't there and yeah, you, yeah. I've, I've been I've, no like, no no definitely <laughs> yeah. not no way. because yeah because his attraction was far beyond his ability just whether or not he could <laughs> sing in tune yeah. to exactly at some yeah. gig um yeah yeah good point so so you did did you finish two years of that yeah i didn't finish the um uh what were we going to get like a certificate diploma so yeah I yeah so you know they were so the, the woman that was singing i mean they were phenomenal you know mm. but phenomenal sopranos and i was just like you're like i just can't do that mm. and yeah doing my eddie vitti cover eddie vita covers and the teacher's saying yeah but jordan we know you can do that and i was yeah. like well you know what do you want me to do? I, I can't. I literally can't do a Whitney Houston cover. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Or just so, you know, yeah, shift it yeah. down an octave. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would almost be interesting. I'd listen to I'd listen to Winnie Houston yeah. down in Octa. Um, <laughs> They're not probably gonna reach the bottom though. Right? Yeah. Oh maybe a fifth. Yeah. Yeah, um, actually, I've got a relatively large range, but it's the break I figured out is the problem. Is I've got quite a big break. Well, I think that you've you've I think you've really made that work for you though, because one thing I've noticed with your voice, or like a lot of the melodies that you choose, you do this really cool thing that where you shift between your chest and your head voice, like yeah. in, in a melody, like you know. Yeah, that, yes, that's exactly how I use it. Yeah, that's, that's clever that you notice that because yeah, well, you, you can you can like throw over it. It gives you a little bit of extra grunt. Yeah. When you switch, yeah. And because the tonal difference is so marked, it actually it's really interesting. Like they're really interesting and cool melodies to listen to, uh, because of the. Oh, thank you. Uh, because of the the yeah the difference in tonal flavor, which yeah. I mean I know for some singers they'll try and make it so that there's you know they try to not only close the gap, but try and make it so that um, there's as little difference in tone as possible as they as yeah. they traverse between their chest and head. And, you know, you're... Or they don't, they don't like one one of the, you know, either above the break or below the break, so they avoid it. And I used to yeah. do that. I was like, I won't sing above my break because it's, mm. it's sort of weak and um, too ethereal, you know, um, so I wouldn't use it. But, but well, I mean, you figured out a way of kind of making... I, I mean, I wouldn't say it was weak, certainly, like, seem to be able to hit those notes with quite a lot of power but the the tonal difference is marked and um mm. it, i mean it catches the air it's it's really interesting it sounds cool oh cheers um, buddy. so you did two years of that and then then what'd you do is that when you did your like technology degree i mean at now some I point to, now i have to remember oh no i did i think i took a year off because i was looking after i was looking after a kid with cerebral palsy for about right. a year maybe two wow and then then i did oh and i was then i then i was with rob and we did web development and we just sort of he was into coding and i learned cgi programming mm. and stuff web development from him yeah then i got a horrible corporate job at shell oil doing internet development fuck i'd forgotten about that and, one yeah because it, it was short-lived um yeah. it, it was it was soul destroying eh? and i was just oh, like I when do i get to do something and people spent a lot of effort seemingly to sort of avoid doing anything it was mind-alteringly boring hmm. uh, and then i went then i went to cit and studied software engineering that's right and i, I remember you learning to like code for microcontrollers and so on right at quite yeah, a low level so, like yeah. pretty close to the middle yeah assembly language i love yeah that's that. right Fun man, that was cool. That's um, yeah. well, that's an impressive thing to to be good at. <laughs> it was another one of those things where behind the scenes I cried and thought I'll never be able to do. That. Yeah. Well, but it, I mean, it's your ability to just keep going despite feeling that way. Whereas I think that would that would probably stop me <laughs> with a lot of things. Yeah. Or at least yeah. I. Do you know one thing I've learned though? Sometimes it should stop you because I think. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, you know, who I was trying to prove something to. Certainly myself, which is okay. But then, you know, because I was in that at that point in time, I think I was trying to not want to do music because, you know, that's not smart enough. You know, my dad mm. wouldn't, you know, dad was a big pusher for intellectual things, which I'd internalized right. a great deal. And then, you know, keeping on with the music, a lot of that was to, you know, try and prove <laughs> that, that, you know, I was worth something to, you know, members of my family. And when I finally realized that, you know, the impetus to, to keep doing music, it, it backed off. It really did. It's like, well, now I'm not trying to prove anything to them because they're, they're never going to find it valuable. You know, right. um, what do I do? Um, but by then, fortunately, I had this awesome fan base and just started paying all my attention to them. It's like, do you like it? Um, yeah which was really nice. But yeah, I think sometimes determination is overrated. It's a fine line to find, you know, what's good because sometimes we're driven to do things to, to prove to others instead of proving to ourselves. But knowing that we're doing that is, is such a tricky thing because the extent to which we internalize, you know, the messages about should, mm. you know, should is, is a bad word. <laughs> You know, why should? Where's the should coming from? Is it coming from my deep desire to become a software engineer? Or is yeah. it becoming is it coming from my deep desire, you know, to prove to my dad that I'm I'm not stupid? Um, so yeah, 
tricky. So I think you should not berate yourself for giving some things up because some things deserve to be given up because you're not in much as enough in love with them, as you said, to persist. Mm. Well, sometimes what I find is, uh, like, I'll get to basically a certain level of difficulty or complexity. And, yeah. and at the point where it becomes really, really hard and I'd have to work really, really hard to go beyond that level, I'll be like, I don't enjoy this. This is no longer fun. I'm going to find a way around it. So I'll find an easier way of accomplishing yeah. the thing that that learning that would have accomplished, um, which I don't I don't know that that's really a positive quality. It's something I should probably work uh, with. I, I should do some hard things. Be. Yeah, ingenuity. <laughs> not, just, ingenuity. <laughs> not just being a genetic slacker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who doesn't, doesn't want to work too hard? It's a fine line, hey. We, mm. it's, and, and often we only know in retrospect. I strongly believed at the time that I really wanted to be a software engineer. You know, yeah. I, do, I do still love coding. It's it's fun. But, you know, I think that – I don't think it was my calling, as, as you know, as people say, because right. I think it was too mixed up with other voices. So I think sometimes the desire, you know, to give up or the feeling, you know, oh, I'm just not into this enough, mm. sometimes it's correct. You know, it's just knowing, it's just knowing whether am I just being lazy or yeah. am I just berating myself for being lazy when there's a proper other reason I'm giving up. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and so you got that qualification that took you like what, a year or two? Yeah. Um, uh, I think two. Yeah, two. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then what was your next kind of educational thing? Uh, cause yeah, then I was a software engineer for a few right. years and then what kind of work did you do? Then, like who'd you work for as a software uh, engineer? Embedded systems, uh, yeah, right. AB systems was the first one and then CE solutions, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we're doing, uh, one of them was like, uh, I think water purity control, storage control, maybe, uh, uh -huh. gadgets. Um, and that was the yeah, embedded systems and for CE solutions, I did a flight controller thing. Um, and I'm, I hope it's I, I cannot remember, but it must have been a simulation because surely I was just fresh out, you know, fresh graduate. It must have been a sim. Uh, and an ATM. That was a real one. So, like, yeah, fuck, I'm doing an ATM. Ooh, that'd be quite fun. <laughs> yeah. And our washing machine. We did. Yep. Um, yeah. And, but that was, yeah, that was a mix of assembly and C, yep. which was cool. But, yeah, just after that, I decided – Possibly because of the stuff with you know embedded systems and water treatment, I decided I wanted to do environmental engineering. <laughs> right. So I went back. To, I went to Massey and started that. Um, and as part of that, there was a philosophy paper, and it just it just literally blew my mind. I was just I hadn't encountered philosophy before, except for you know our, our long conversations with Jazz, which I'd find really frustrating because I had no idea <laughs> a lot of right, the time right, right. I was talking about. Yeah. Um, and um. Yeah, it just it blew my mind. And so I decided I wanted to do philosophy. But um, in the meantime, yeah, I was sort of at the end of one relationship and uh, fell in love with a German. So I decided to just sell everything I owned mm. and go to Germany. Why not? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, why, why not? <laughs> I think. Oh, yeah, I was 27. So what was the other option? I could, yeah. I could shoot myself yeah. as an attempt to sell albums. Yeah. Um, Kill yourself or marry a German. Brutal humor. Yeah, well, um, I think you made the right choice, yeah, so Why not? <laughs> and it didn't work out, obviously. Yeah. So I ended up busking and squatting in an abandoned flat. Mm -hmm. um, that was pretty brutal. Um, and when. Oh, hang on, wait a minute. What happened to your environmental degree? Well, that's slash thing, philosophy. Because right. I had fallen in love, I decided. Yeah. So you abandoned that, but then came back after that. Yeah, I came down. back. And when I came back, I went to Auckland Uni. I remember. Yeah, yeah. Because I was living in Auckland, like, the time that I lived there overlapped with you being there. Yeah, yeah. That was a really cool time, actually. Yeah. yeah. yeah it was. It was, it was cool. Yeah. Um, yeah no, those were actually and you f years. Did you, f years. did you finish your Phil degree there? Yeah, I finished my Phil degree. Phil, yeah. Phil and Sosh. Yeah. Phil and Sosh. Yeah. And I, I wanted to, I, I thought maybe I'll do a master's and then I sort of mm. lost impetus because I was like, well, what am I going to do with this? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. teach it, I guess, really. Like that seems yeah, to be the option exactly. mostly. But, yeah, exactly. And I already knew I'm not, it's weird because um, my family, are, uh, a lot of, there's a lot of teachers in my family too, like yours, my mum's my, my side, her, her yeah. dad yeah. was a teacher and um, 
Well, Sam, Sam's a teacher, teacher now teacher. too, isn't yeah, she? Sam's a teacher now, exactly. Did I tell you I ran into I guess... her? Ah, no. No, I'll tell you that story. I'll finish finish your thing. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll tell you what, how that went down. Oh, uh, I can't remember where I am. The chaotic. Uh, so you finished your field degree in Auckland. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just decided, uh, you know, the music was going on. I realised, you know, the population thing. It's just not going to. It's not going to happen. You know, it's like you play the goth scene and you play the goth ball and, yeah. you know, that's... There just aren't enough people. That, that scene is super supportive, but, you know, we we are not enough. And mm. I loved about the Auckland alternative scene. It's like, you know, the punks who don't really necessarily like goth music, they'll show up to support, you know, and so you've got all the alternative groups mm. showing up to just support anything alternative and we're still not enough. <laughs> no. So, yeah, I just, oh, fuck this. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go back to Germany. Yeah. Um, um, so I did. Yeah. And then you, uh, and then, uh, so in terms of like your education since then, have you done any formal education since going back to Germany? Uh, I just started to, um, the, the, this, this rational part of me that I can't ditch gets annoyed at me admitting this, it translates to naturopath as Heilpraktikerin. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we do, you know, everything's formalised in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. What I really love is is plant medicine, which right. I'm also studying through a through an American school. Uh, and but to be able to practice it, I have to have a German relevant qualification. So studying that, it's a lot of it's medicine basically to the extent you know that we don't accidentally kill anyone, so we have to do sort of basic medicine. Right. But it's it's pretty hardcore. I must go easy on the hemlock. Yeah, yeah. So, so go easy on the hemlock. You know, we actually have to delve into, you know, all of the, the, the detailed cell stuff, cell organelles and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, blood, lymph, everything. Um, but, you know, obviously so where, where doctors would have to memorize, you know, a billion bones and muscles, we, we, we don't have to memorize as many. <laughs> so, yeah. And you would, uh, yeah. so is it kind of like medicine, but there's not as much processing on the actual stuff, you know, like you're getting... You're basically getting the plant or whatever from nature, and then maybe doing. Uh, yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't really deal in, in chem prescription drugs. That's that's essentially it. Yeah. Uh, so it's herbs and well, as for the for the naturopath qualification, but I'll be sticking to plants. And mm. you know, the thing is, I have only been doing this for three months, so it's hard to see how it compares to to a lot of things in terms of the naturopath stuff. And to be honest, I don't know if I'll finish it because. <laughs> Songs have started to come back, and I'm trying oh. to ignore them. I know. Uh. I'm just trying to ignore them because it's like, well, I don't. How many times have you retired from music now? Just yeah, as a question. I know. Well, this time, this time, fortunately, I'm just doing it for the people of fans. I wouldn't. I would never tour it. I can't. You yeah. know, it's not possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because you know, because of the the illness and stuff, I, I can only work part-time and I'm a monotasker. I would have to quit my job and take six months off to do the album. So right. I'm really, really pushing it away. Whereas yeah. painting I can do at the same time as working. Right. You know. Yeah, so, I imagine it's pretty. It's e probably easier with painting that you can just do a little bit until you run out of energy and then just, yes, you know, keep yes. working on it like Which, that. Ah, you probably know this from poems actually because mm. – you know, when you're dealing in text, it, it circles in your head. It circles in your head when you're asleep. It, yeah. it, it's, you're, oh. it, it owns you. I have, written, I have written my best poems when I've been about to go to sleep and they've never been recorded and I've forgotten them in the morning. And, no. But uh, so many. And, it's you know, because one of the things I used to do to fall, try and fall asleep was to write poems just in my head. Mm. And, like, some fucking wow. amazing poems. Amazing. Yes. But it's like, they're gone. They're all gone. And so I stopped. Yeah, I stopped doing it because it pissed me off. Yeah, yeah. The rule that everyone talks about: you must write it down. Just yeah. write it down. It's but it's like I'm trying to go to sleep. I'm really <laughs> tired. I don't want to get up and find a fucking pen, or you know. But that's why it comes in because it's like your ego yeah. is asleep, right? Like, so, right? So it just drifts yeah, through right. you, and you and you can recognise it. So you've got to write it down. Uh, I don't. Because that's when I, you get out of your own way. Well, here we go. This is my solution: is just to stop doing it. You know what I do to fall asleep yeah, now? I and I would normally discourage you were I not doing the same thing right now. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. actually, no, you go first. Like, tell me, like, what, what do you do mentally to try and fall asleep? 
Uh, and now, by now, I, I meditate. I meditate. meditate this right. is another thing about being old. I remember people talking about that and thinking, what a load of shit. Yeah. Um, and it's the, the single most helpful thing oh, in terms yeah. of my mental health. Yeah. 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 I've got a lot of friends who are, who are super into it. Um, what I do to oh, try really? and fall asleep is just imagine that I had a billion dollars and then what I'm going to really? do with it, right? Yeah, because it's like it's yeah. it's a stupid fantasy uh, yeah. and, and it doesn't matter, like... I mean, uh, okay, with poetry, if I was sitting there writing a poem, I'm going to be pissed off if I write a good poem in my head uh, yeah, and, and don't write it down. But it's like if I have a dumb fantasy about ways I would spend a billion dollars, like who cares yeah. if I forget it? Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. And, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, just, it's, it's, you, don't, it, you don't want to write it down. Cause yeah, that's like... right, because it's always dumb. And so just yeah. the sheer vapidity of the exercise is, <laughs> is its um, salient and valuable feature. Me. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Fuck, fuck meditation. Do, uh, do, do facile fantasy. What if I were king of the world? Yeah. yeah. What would be my first decree? Yeah, yeah. that sort of shit. Um, awesome. I did promise I was going to tell you about how I ran into Sam. So uh, Sam, yeah, is, yeah. Sam is one of Jordan's sisters. Uh, yeah, for, yeah. For people who don't know. <laughs> so I mean, I hadn't seen her since you know I was twenty probably, and it was during a phase in my life not that many years ago. Uh, when I was just very intensely into poetry, as is sometimes happening, happens. Mm. And what happens when I get into that mindset is like I start going to all the poetry readings and all the poetry related events that happen, which are quite a few, you know, um, around Wellington because of the sort of city it is. Yeah. And so I went yeah. to one at Te Papa, which was just a bunch of poets reading their work, like, you know, fairly well respected or up and coming type poets uh, for yeah. some, you know, writers' festival or whatever it was. And so I'm just sitting there, like, listening and checking out the poems. And who gets up to read a poem? Ah! And who was it, Jordan? Sam, That's right. right. That, it was Sam. And I was like, you look extremely familiar. And then she, it was a poem about your parents. Uh, oh. And it was like, you know, some, some well, I mean, I, my memory's not the best, but it, it was something like a car trip or something. And it would, yeah. and it, I think, I think the you and your sister were in the car as well. I mean, Sam will yeah. maybe listen to this and tell me I've got it completely wrong. Uh, maybe yeah. some kind of car trip, and I think it was her witnessing like the beginning of your parents' relationship sort of falling apart. Uh, yeah. And that's what the that's what the poem was about. And so, I mean, to me, it was so vivid listening to it too, because I knew the personalities, you know, I knew the people, yeah, and could really imagine them sort of saying and doing those things. And I went up and spoke to her I'm afterwards. I'm so glad she's writing about that too, because that's yeah. amazing. Well, I mean, it's it was really good. The code, the code of silence around all of our family stuff. Mm. It's like you just, you know, we just weren't allowed to talk about it. I mean, that's why really I don't have contact with anyone but Tab, because mm. uh, there's protocols. It's like it's like that German thing, you know. <laughs> Here you can, you, you can say what needs to be said, but, you know, it's it's very English. I mean, they are, were both English, and that sort of – Treating around, treating, treating around the white elephant in the room, and you know it was so ingrained that if you even suggest there may be some kind of possible animal in the room, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, enough, yeah, dead silence, you, you're ostracised. Um, yes, so right. I'm, I'm glad that she's writing about that. Yeah, and I mean this was a few years ago, and I went and spoke to her and found out what she was doing. I know she's gotten married, and I think she's a, a school teacher. Are uh, you yeah, Merrick? That, that really, they're a cool couple, actually. Yeah. They, they seem to fit really well. Yeah. And, I mean, she really, you know, I got the impression she was much happier than she was when I knew her and, and that yeah. her life was, you know, sorting itself out. Um, mm. But it was just it was just so random. I mean, you know, the, the last thing I would have imagined to have happened. Uh, yeah. That's... I should try and chase her up, actually, and see if I can figure out um, if she's released a, an actual book or something I could buy. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, anyway, yeah, I said I'd... I tell you that story. Um, yeah, and so I, I'm kind of not surprised because Wellington is like you know as soon as you're involved in cultural stuff and you know even the landscape, all the hills sort of pour down into the middle where the cultural stuff is happening. Yeah, it's you know it's it's one of the coolest you know of all the towns I've lived in, and it's it's really got its charm, eh? Like, oh, absolutely, and you know yeah, it's, it's been I'm, why I'm surprised I've you haven't bumped into her before. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe don't go out as much as I used to, and maybe the things I do go out to aren't the sorts of places that one might find her. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. That, actually, something about living in Wellington and then going overseas, I don't know if you found this as well, but you're so used to the hills being around you 
that when you like and whereas most of the world like most of the cities you go to in the world you don't have that the hills don't completely encircle the place that you live and so i go other places and i actually feel like sort of exposed because those hills yes. are missing like yeah. um like i'm just a fly crawling on the face of the earth and under the sun or something like that um, yeah, and there's no you, you don't see the earth because only sort of very flatly. Around. Did, did you notice also um, the smell of the sea? If you're far enough inland, yeah. something's just disturbing, and you don't know what it is, and then you realise you can't smell the sea because you know New Zealand being so long and thin, you can mm. smell the sea from everywhere. Yeah, and I mean, yeah, even as far as you can get inland, it's not going to be that long to get to the sea either. You could go there, yeah. but and even if you don't go there, right? Like it just you have it in your head that it would be easy to go to the sea. Uh, even yeah. if you're not really conscious of it, and if you travel somewhere and that's not the case, then you start to miss it, even if it wasn't like something that you were taking advantage of when you had the choice. Like, I don't think I've gone for a swim in the sea in years, but part of my brain is aware that at any moment I wanted to, I could. Yeah, and you live you live next to the sea in Wellington. Yeah. It's constantly there, yeah, like a couple hundred meters. Actually, um, Tomek, who said about. Uh, Auckland being like Sim City, mm. he also said, um, "You guys live like mountain goats." Uh, and um, I was like, "Why is that?" And because he noticed the hills. You know, we've got yeah. so many towns that have just and got the, and the, volcanoes. Well, yeah, that's and right. And like the houses, houses like on an angle, exhausting. just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it's all it's all exhausting. I don't want to go for a walk. You know. <laughs> yeah, Wellington's shocking for that too. It's, yeah. Oh yeah, there's so many places. If you yeah, live there, it's just shopping. oh yeah. Walking up and down hills all the time. Yeah, yeah. Just stay home. That's my advice to everyone. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have to now, don't you? Yeah. Uh, no, not for us. Not for us. Um, Every, we've been back to normal for ages. Uh, the only thing yeah. now is, um, if you want to come into the country, you have to quarantine. But apart from that, uh, okay. everything's normal. We have we have a curfew in Germany. Really? Oh, I Everyone heard. They're going to lock down harder, aren't they? Be bed. Yeah, yeah. Everyone has to be at home by 10 o'clock because, you know, obviously the virus is going to get infinitely more dangerous at 10 o'clock. Viruses mm. being able to tell the time. Yeah, they're good like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, actually, I was in a queue for the doctor on Monday, mm. uh, which is, is famously their worst day anyway. But one of the doctors was sick, and because of the corona measures, the, the queue literally went down the street. And I wow. went for... I think it was two hours before I got into the practice, mm. by which time, of course, I'd missed my appointment. But there was an old guy in front of me, and mm. he fell over. And mm. his, his helpers had to just help him into his car because he couldn't he couldn't stand that long. And um, no. I just spent the whole time listening to <clears throat> older Germans and Poles telling stories about how this is just like the DDR or living under communism in right. Poland. And it was it was really interesting and. And yeah, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, dangers exist. Uh, however, I think that, you know, I think they're being really, really used to whatever local government's advantage. Eh? And it's just, it's kind of shocking that, you know, sure, we've we've got to do something. But um, I have to say that <laughs> Germany has proved itself to have a sometimes pathological trust of their authority figures. Yeah. You know, and this just feels like one of those occasions. And, you know, I'm not the first person to say this. And it's not it's not about being a corona denier or something like that. It's just like, why has a curfew got why does that have any sense in a small town where no one goes out at night anyway unless they have a dog, mm. which you know we're still allowed to do. Um and is this not just some sort of method of control? Well, what do you think the advantage is to the local authorities of exerting that control? Oh, just slowly getting people used to the fact that we have to do particular things. Um, here's an example, actually, because the Deutsche Bank has been a three-legged dog for a long time. You know, people yeah. know that, worrying about its failing and so on. Um, so Germany has been pushing for a cashless system for a very long time as well. Right. So one of the first thing that happens when Corona um, hit, hit Germany was, oh, use use touchless because it's more hygienic, you know, which is obviously true. Right. However, it's like uh, it's a sign that you know this this situation exists, but let's push push through these other agendas because you know it happens to be helpful. To uh, us yeah, I, I see what you're saying, and that's right. what I mean. So it's not like you know I think these things are happening in parallel. So it's just yeah. like we have a situation. However. 
because, you know, we've got these other agendas that we couldn't push through while everyone else was concentrating on them. Mm. Let's do it now by, you know, slowly getting people used to small things that we're taking away from them. This will seem like nothing. They should, they should yeah. call it like pandemic pork barreling. Yeah, yeah, pandemic. That's a great. That's a great expression for it because it is. And you notice this because the different agendas that different countries have had. Mm. That's what's sort of going through in the background whilst whilst they're taking you know the obvious, obviously helpful health measures. Yeah. They'll, they'll do these sort of unnecessary things. Um, so I, I just find it kind of worrying. And I guess yeah. I came to that just just hearing the locals on the street saying, "Yeah, well, that, that's how it started." Here as well with you know with the stars and people are informing on each other here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, brother turning and brother, children yeah. informing on their parents. Yeah, and yeah. and so of course for these people it's going to have a super bad resonance, mm. and they're like, you know, this what's going on? Um, and I think that you know the the, the powers that be should really know you're going, you're going to terrify your populace if you start doing things that resonate with the, the bad old times. Yeah, bad optics. So they could at least be a little bit more cautious in terms of the psychological cost for people. Yeah, and I, I think maybe they have, well, different societies and so on, or haven't always done a good job of weighing up the benefit um, of the lockdowns for any given situation or whatever, um, and no, the actual and the cost. The cost. Yeah, I mean, they decide you know, what's a core need, and it's like you know, core needs are you know obviously food and these other things, but um, certain other things are not considered core needs, like turning up to see your counsellor, you know, because right. if, you, if you stay at home and go a bit crazy and beat your wife, which is, you know, what's happening, increase, there's a massive increase in domestic violence. Well, yeah. But, you know, essential service is not having your, your anger management class because you're not allowed to meet with mm. X number of people. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's a very tough job, but certain things should be an obvious parallel mm. 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 um oh well another thing that i i did sort of want to bring up um was uh was your health at the moment uh, which is which is not great and like we don't have to talk about it if you don't want but i, I thought i don't know maybe have you been talking about it to the people who follow your music or have you sort of explained uh, no, to the people there's maybe a few people that know uh that i'm sort of you know that follow my music but are also friends mm. um but yeah no it's 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 been an interesting learning experience is this the bright side of it um mm. but yeah, it's basically um autoimmune disease which yeah. started as me lying in bed for I th it was almost two years really having wow. to order my food online through tesco's because i delivered because i was too tired to go to the shop mm. um and not being able to tour, tours would fall through because I just had these bouts of extreme exhaustion. Mm. And, you know, they don't they don't test very well in England. They're on a budget. So it took that long for them to say this is, you know, chronic fatigue and under-functioning thyroid. Right. Uh, which then just sort of the, the autoimmune stuff got worse. Um, you know, so it interferes with touring, obviously, because it's a sort of a – the pattern is – what's it called? Remission um, – remission relapse pattern so you have these pat this time where you think oh whatever it is i'm getting well so you know fuck it i'm not going to the doctor i'm just happy to be getting well and then it, then it hits you again right and then you know the the relapses get more and more and then so you have to investigate it but i guess the interesting part is you know learning learning the extent to which these things occur in uh well do you know about the a score thing adverse childhood experiences no i don't um, i found that my sister that? also has um, she has hashimoto's thyroid i hope she doesn't mind me saying that in case she's listening but um mm -hmm. it's also an autoimmune disease and these things are really quite linked to to um to trauma which you know a lot of people have in their background um and you know from that this thing with it you know the repeated sort of bad thoughts in my head these sort of patterns i'd internalized that you know i no longer need to because i don't live in that environment anymore right so sort of noticing a lot of the things that i tell myself about whether things are going to get better um whether everything is shit just because the health is so shit mm. um and trying to trying to break those patterns so you know managing to live a life where i can say that you know a lot of the time i'm content i have some really long dark phases but they uh, they don't 
they don't get to me as much as they used to. I can function. Right. Um, and a lot of that has just been noticing the thought patterns with the meditation and the, you know, having to describe things differently or being able to act differently and not getting the results. So I always tell myself I'll get negative results. So, and just seeing the link between that and my health, I mean, it's, I still have autoimmune disease and right. um, it's still attacking my bone marrow, but uh, I, I don't feel bad about it. If that makes any sense, it's kind of, I'm detached from it to the extent that I'll still do something, you know, I'll still do all the measures that need to be taken to, to look after it. Um, for anyone that is suffering from autoimmune disease, that's listening. Uh, diet is massively important. Um, mm. For me, it turned out that milk products were, and I love Polish milk products. Oh, <laughs> they have, they have things you literally cannot translate. because they don't exist either in Germany or in New Zealand. So, you know, what Germans call quark, we don't have in New Zealand, I don't think. <laughs> and the Poles have like six different kinds of it with different names. They were delicious, but they screwed with my um, gut flora really badly. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a big uh, leaky gut component to it, which I sorted out with the herbalism, which mm -hmm. is how I got into herbalism. I managed to sort that one out myself. Um, the other things I, I can't do on my own, but... Uh, you know, just all of those things together, trying to get intrigued by it, trying to think of it as a metaphor as well. Um, one of the Jungian podcasts did that, the, the autoimmune is um, this sort of uh, self-annihilation. You're trying to you're trying to literally just kill all the aspects of yourself that you don't like. Right. Um, and I found that metaphor of, you know, just self-annihilation really useful so it's like listening to my head talk how do i how do i annihilate myself before i've even started <laughs> by expecting oh if i go out and talk to anyone they'll just hate me <laughs> stop thinking that they don't oh. mind if you tell them their ideas are shit well, so you, carry on you were yeah. talking to me about the fact that one of the symptoms um can result in it being both hard for you to talk and to eat yeah uh that's where it attacks my mucous membranes so i get these yeah. massive like, they're snail sized blood filled pustules mm. yeah so i have to lance them because i can't talk or eat they're huge um, but in terms of like a jungian analysis right like if you have problems with, yeah, um, with eating and with talking and, and your thoughts yes, around those exactly. things like just as a metaphor yeah. i suppose it's yeah, yeah articulating myself exactly um because they, they happened on my tongue as well articulating oh. who i am and you know obviously the you know the the history of eating disorders as you know mm. about yeah doesn't help um it's partly why diet is is so useful because before it would all be about just oh god you know I, if i put on weight everyone will hate me mm. um or it'll be a failure that's the other thing mm. um that, you know and those things you know you just have to sort of get rid of them also they have in europe they seem to have a, you know a slight more a more affinity for for larger figures so you know you, you don't get the sort of compliments for for being thin that you might get in cultures like America and, and New Zealand, which oh, helps. That, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, that. it is interesting. I think partly because they have a history of really genuine poverty and like mm -hmm. looking like a junkie is just like, you're probably homeless and have a serious problem. So it's not sexy. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, which, is, which is quite rational. Um, but yeah, and I think certainly that would have contributed to, to the, the problems as well. Cause you know, autoimmune doesn't happen overnight. Right, no. Um, but yeah, if anyone suffering from it, your diet is, is super crucial, um, just no processed foods. Uh, I cut out gluten products as well. I don't have a gluten allergy. It helped a bit, but the real key was was dairy and just eating fresh veggies, lots of them, fresh right. fruit. Um, and lower carb, they've found that that's very helpful for um, – uh, the, the diet I did f at first was an anti-cancer diet. It's, it's, it's extremely low carb, but then I noticed it just sort of fed into the eating disorder behavior too much because it's too restrictive. Was it was it so, putting you into ketosis? Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I don't. Some people don't go into ketosis well. I came to Ayurvedic healing te um, techniques through that because certain body types, mine's Vata. It's the sort of the wind one. We're just sort of you know torn here and there, but a highly strung, a little bit neurotic, <laughs> mm. uh, and uh, it, uh, fasting and and low carb doesn't really work for our body type. So I found it just really stressed me out over time. It, it was okay at first, but um, it made me really stressy. It disrupted my sleep. Um, 
and so yeah just increasing carbs and that of course just makes a lot more food choices open because you know I'm one of those people if I see a bunch of restrictions and go oh yeah I can do that and then I use it as an excuse to put yeah, yeah. Eating I, I've met you quite know, a few vegans like that actually yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So this is an excuse to perpetuate your eating disorder, but you, mm. you can't say that to a person with an eating no, disorder. No. They'll deny it until they're blue in the face. Yeah, that's right. Um, as I would have. <laughs> oh, no. So I love the animals. It's about the animals. I love them. Yeah, it's about the animals. Like, yeah. like maybe partly, but not only, mm. I think. Yeah, not only. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But, um, yeah, that's the other thing was it happens a lot at middle age. I mean, we get, especially women, and there's combined with perimenopause, it's, it's a bitch. There's mm. very little literature out there on peri perimenopause and how basically the hormone production um, is taken over, not in your ovaries anymore for, for estrogen and progesterone, it shifts to your adrenals. Uh, so in that shift, a lot of things can, you know, go awry. You'll become either estrogen dominant or progesterone, progesterone dominant, which can lead to polycystic ovary system, which it has with me, which again throws your endocrine system out. Oh no! Uh, we get a lot of problems with thyroid. Where in England they'll only test your TSH, which is completely senseless because T3 is what your body uses for energy. Mm -hmm. uh, T4 is badly converted to T3 in a lot of pre um, menopausal women or premenopausal women. So, you know, I, I had that one as well. Um, a lot of women do. Uh, but because doctors won't test your T3 and T4, um, a lot of women walk around wondering why they feel so KO'd all the time. Wow. And the doctors say your thyroid's fine because they've only looked at TSH. Why, why don't they test the other ones? What's their, yeah, cause their, their rationale? Budget. Yeah, because uh, they It's all budgeting. Just expensive. They're deliberately cutting yeah, and they the the oh, well, hang on, they have an excuse out. to legislate for private. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, just insist on it for anyone out there who's a perimenopausal woman and you're feeling ratchet. <laughs> mm. Go get your endocrine stuff done. T three and T four is very important. Um, mm. And yeah, those those things will feed in if, if you don't address them. They can, on their own, lead to autoimmune dysfunction. So, you know, that's that's what happened, which is a bad scene. And then, you know, there's, there's no cure, so it is managed with diet, which is in a way a good thing because you don't have to necessarily resort to chemicals, um, though I take the thyroid ones. So, but at the moment, you've kind of, it's managed enough that I suppose you can work and do... Yeah, have a little bit of energy 20 hours a week yeah that's yeah. the thing I've, I've tried i tried 35 at first and then 30 and i just kept getting relapse relapse and right. um 20 seems to work but it, it's hard because you know i don't i don't have family support or you know i haven't been here that long either so you're living by yourself you know, it's minimum wage for 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 20 hours a week it's a hard and then you're eating lots of fresh veg that's my main cost is food yeah <laughs> yeah um, are, you, are you living by yourself in your situation at the moment yeah yeah i've, yeah. I've got my dog chomsky oh yeah some, some of you are here only to listen to Chomsky of the people I Facebooked. <laughs> he's he's very healthy. Ah, that was the other thing that turned me to herbalism. He had a massive liver problem. Yeah, I remember. Uh, the first corona wave. Yeah. yeah, and they said, oh, these liver values are bad. You know, it could be Cushing's, it could be cancer, all these things. Mm. Um, it wasn't those things, but they said, oh, you know, his liver's failing. He, you know, be prepared for him to die. Mm. So... I looked up herbalism and I gave him, uh, God, what is it in English? Ole Ostropesto, um, milk thistle, that's what it is. Right. And his, his liver values returned to normal. Wow. And his kidney values went his kidney values went up because it's been shifted, I guess, along the chain or something. Um, but then um, then we worked out that one with diet. I gave him um, also, I, I still give him, uh, pumpkin is like uh, is to dogs what avocado is to humans, right? And um, some you know a low level of uh, brennisil. What the fuck is that? Um, stinging nettle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's healthy. He's very healthy now. He's just old. How old is he? Yeah. Fifteen. That is super old for a dog, man. Yeah. And you yeah. should see him run. He, he's partly blind and deaf, so he will yeah. sometimes run into a tree. I should not. Oh, no. <laughs> he's so joyous in this blind running. Uh, you know, 
Yeah. Oh, there's a, there's a poem in that somewhere. Joyous, yeah. joyous in his blind running. Yeah, and crashing into a tree. Yeah. And he seems so outraged that the tree is there. It's like, I know, it's... like it just sprang up just to fuck with him. Yeah, yeah, just to fuck with him, yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, so yeah, the health stuff, is, it's been part of the transformative process though, you know, it made me address a lot of things that I probably would have just sort of stumbled forward without reflecting on my own, my own input into my own demise, so to speak. Um, mm. So it forced me to look at a lot of that, which is what a lot of people say about having autoimmune as well. Yeah. It makes you address some very important things. And because and you have such a lack of time and energy, you really do have to figure out what, what am I going to give that time and energy for? So, you know, yeah. really, what do I, what do I love? Um, it does help you, you know, cut out the weeds, so to say. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I could see that. Um, and I suppose, well, am I doing the New Zealand thing? I was about to sort of say something along the lines of however awful it is. Uh, I suppose at least you've found a way to function and not be miserable. Yeah, well, I've realised I've been doing the New Zealand thing with it the whole time. Yeah. Because <laughs> there, are, there are days where I just sit around and cry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but. Can um, we have a long silence where we think about you sitting around and crying? Yeah, no, we don't have to do that anymore. I've, oh. I've done that bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> Too much. But yeah, uh, actually, and, and the meditation thing really helped with that. That just. Mm. You know that, that stuff. At the end of the day, it's it's not it's not that important because you know the things I love my dog, I, I love the community that I'm part of here, and I love painting, mm. and it has not taken any of those things away from me. In fact, it's made me realise how much they're worth. So you know, I I don't want to. I certainly don't want to say to anyone with autoimmune disease, oh, there's a bright side because you know there there are times when if you if you hear that, you just want to punch the person that said it in the face. Yeah, you right. really do. And that's a phase you have to go through. It's just the sort of rage. Of, Why the fuck is this also happening? You know, um, and then at some point you, you, you don't, you can't fall any deeper and then you just start to have to change the way you have to change the way you think about it because there's no other way. The way out is through as they so, so often say. Mm. And that's part of it. Looking at your thought processes, looking at what's valuable to you. Um, also doing the thing, doing what you can to help it. You know, you can't, you can't necessarily fix it, but you can, you can mitigate. Well, you cut out. That's it. Um, mitigate and, yes. you know, not listening to GPs that say, oh, sorry, we can't do anything, take these really potent immune suppressants whilst there's a plague going on. Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I have been frustrated sometimes with people. They seem to have an attitude to doctors that if you go to a doctor and they say something, then that's kind of the end of it. Like, you know, you've got to do that thing or there is no help or there's nothing yeah. you can do. And it's like, man, look, honestly, shop around. Um, the same way that you would, well, Particularly with mental health, yeah, I absolutely. would say, like when people get a counselor and they get a counselor or a psychologist or whatever and don't find them helpful, they're like, oh yeah, I tried it. And it's like, well, you didn't really. I mean, you just keep going until you find someone who's, who's yeah. sort of helpful and good and can work with you as you are and that you get, you know, you have a rapport with or whatever. That might not be the first cab yeah. off the rank. And I, I think it's. Um, yeah, the same that's for an doctors. incredibly good parallel. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, and actually the parallel would go further because if you're going to a counsellor often it's because, you know, you, f you feel you have trouble coping. And then when you find one that doesn't fit, you actually feel, like, oh, no one can help me. And, and yeah. you're very inclined to despair. But yeah. you, have, you, have to, you have to shop around because, you know, some of them are terrible. It's like there are terrible mechanics. Mm. You know, you can think of it that way. You know, you don't yeah, that's right. that says you fix the car and then it, then it, then it breaks down. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's a horribly mechanistic metaphor, but... Um, it, that's that's exactly what you have to do, and it's the same with with medical practitioners because there are some really dangerously shit ones out there. Yeah. And certainly allopathic medicine, it looks at treating the symptoms and just masking symptoms instead of saying, you know, what's causing this? Um, it's like, you know, where's this? Where's this? You know, let's let's say there's I don't know, there's oil leaking into a pool, mm. and instead of actually finding where the oil is coming from, you just keep scooping the oil out that's floating on the top. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you're not going to stop it happening um, mm. and that, that's what a lot of allopathic medicine is um, 
Yeah, yeah. Holistic medicine is, is a very good one because it looks at the psychology psychology aspect, you know, the mind spirit link and things. And you, as a holistic person, functioning organism, um, but even then, like you said, shop, shop around because if someone's telling you, oh, here's this thing, particularly if they say, you know, you might be feeling shit, but there's nothing wrong with your blood work. That's mm. what a lot of people get at the beginning of, of thyroid issues, um, perimenopause, autoimmune. Right. And then once it's actually pathological, they'll say, oh, oh, yeah, well, we can give you this for the for the exhaustion or, or whatever. They're just, you know. Have some speed. <laughs> yeah, take, take some cocaine. This will yeah. sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to hear about that. Do some cocaine and heroin about it. Of the good old days. Yeah, really. Cocaine and laudanum. Mate, you feel great yeah. for, for as long as you're on the cocaine, but you're, you're, you're quietly degrading your health even yeah. more, you know. Well, not quietly with cocaine. Yeah, I mean, allopathic I, <laughs> medicine certainly. Mm. I've certainly had a few, like you know, relatively minor health issues. That, of course, they, they treat the symptoms, but I know that it's actually my lifestyle or other choices I'm making, you know, in a very obvious and direct way that's causing them. But then, yeah. not like, well, maybe you should stop drinking five gallons of coffee a day, buddy. They're like, oh, yeah. you're having these issues? Take these pills. Yeah, and I'll give you, yeah take some Gaviscon, Barney. Yeah, yeah. But keep drinking the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Well, we won't even ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, they sometimes don't. Yeah. Well, yeah. over diet, this is the other thing I found out from podcast digging, that um, a lot of GPs, they don't get training about nutrition. No, so, or, or like it's, you know, very minor and, you know, soon forgotten. Uh, you know, a few yeah, weeks or, or whatever. Something from the, they remember the 80s food pyramid, you know, which yeah, is being right. debunked, and they just insist on that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, man, I'm, I'm keeping you up late, Jordan. Um, oh, so, I'm, I'm enjoying this, Barney. Oh, good, We're under good. lockdown. There's not much social contact going on. Oh, brilliant. Um, <laughs> well, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things I still have on the list. One, one is, I, I guess... Um, because kind of the concept of this podcast really is that um, I just find people doing things I think are interesting who maybe have some kind of intersection or relationship to the goth scene or just are just sort of spooky weirdos in some way. Um, <laughs> and and because I suppose my feeling was that, you know, like I know all these people who are involved with the goth scene or just, you know, even peripherally who do all these really kind of interesting, cool things with their lives that I would like to talk to them about that uh, maybe people aren't hearing about uh, at all or they're not really getting to, to tell their stories anyway, uh, anywhere um, that maybe they remain online, you know, and that people, mm. other people can listen to them. Um, and I know that with you, I suppose particularly through your music, actually another thing I realised I didn't bring up was like that you've, you've made a lot of um, music videos as well. So with... I mean, there's so many things, uh, but you've you've travelled around a lot and seen seen different sort of goth scenes and interacted with them. And I, I guess I was wondering if you've noticed, um, you know, if you can make any kind of generalisations about the differences or, or things that you've noticed that that are different between them uh, as a result yeah. of that process. Um, it's 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 always interesting actually because anthropologically, yeah, the um. One thing that's the commonality is if you come from a goth scene in, in Poland um, or New Zealand or, you know, Germany, but when you meet together, you mm. know, this is what Wave Gothic Treff and where, where Freya was. You yeah, know, yeah, this is so yeah. wonderful. It's like the, irrelevant where you're from, you know, you're obviously part of the alternative scene welcome. Um, mm. And that's that's what I like about Gotham is really that it's just it, it does it does transcend any sort of cultural background despite the fact it, it is done differently in different countries. Um, yeah. And even in actually different locations, because I found like the London goth scene was very different from the northern goths. And oh, I could see that. The North, yeah, because yeah, I think you've you've been there. And Mary will possibly attest to this. I'm not sure if she's right. listening. But yeah, the, the the northern goths they're just sort of you know very unpretentious, like grassroots. They'll yeah they'll wear their, their you know obviously their goth gear. But, you know, some of it's a bit scruffy and, you know, if they haven't had time to do the full makeup, they'll turn up to a gig and, you know, that's all cool. Yeah. And I really like that. It, um, whereas in, in London, you'll get these fantastic outfits where, you know, you'll go to things like Reptile was one of the, the big clubs. Right. I used to go, the DJs were great, but you'd you'd literally have people that had spent six hours oh, yeah. doing yeah. So you'd go there and it's just like this 
incredible like thing to see you know everything's on show but you know at the same time you feel always kind of a bit inadequate you know <laughs> right. or it's it's it, you, you're not sure whether you're supposed to try and do the same as a, a competitive thing I mean they're actually very friendly too but you know when you come to it as an outsider you're just like oh man I'm never going to be accepted um <laughs> so it's 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 got more airs and graces to it I would say the right. London scene but the aesthetics are, are nice to look at, um, whereas, you know, I like hanging out with the, the northern goths. That was cool. And in Germany, of course, you get this um, gothdom that is quite regimented, you know. There seems to be like these – if you're going to deviate from the norm, you must deviate in a particular way. So it seemed very much more that um, there's – Germans a, liking order, liking rules? Yeah, yeah, Go on. I know a cultural cliche mm. and I hope there's no one listening that hates me for saying this but you, you notice that it is it is um more it's got rules to it the, the rules are kind of visible that you know this is a this is a cyber goth and this is a you know well actually I'm not sure if they have cyber goths they probably do but you know there's <laughs> certainly the classic gothdom it's it's very sort of regimented style when and, I am, um, whereas it's it's a lot more experimental. And England loves its eclecticism. You can see you can see that love of eccentricism there. Mm -hmm. And in Poland, this is the very interesting one. It reminds me of New Zealand, weirdly, because they've got really? sixty million people. Yeah. But it's um they've got this you know sort of hideous over the top Catholic government who you know if you, if you have an alternative sexuality you're hated uh, they still right. they still beat people up at the pride parade oh man which is insane um so everyone's kind of a bit scared to deviate so in some ways they dress more conservatively than you know say Germany which is known for its conservatism to not stick out and of course the history of communism was that if you stuck out you were most likely to get targeted so you know you should blend in and you can see that happening there too so you see just about no goths on the street ever right um, if you turn up to a a, a goth gig with you know a big goth band like like Leibach say yeah you're not everyone is actually dressed goth at all there are some people that just look like they walked off a building site you mm. know but they're, technically they're goths they love all of the goth stuff right and um anyone who's brave enough to to dress alternatively whether that be punk goth or you know op openly alternate sexualities um they, they they have to clump together so it's like they'll all go to the same gigs like in new zealand you know right, for protection the, goths, the punks the metlers yeah mm. the goths the punk the metlers they'll all go to the goth gigs even though some of them hate goth music and yeah. it's just to keep the scene alive and, and there's a bit of that in poland too so you know i would always go to the i'd always find you know where, where's the gay club in mm. um you know a foreign town because there you get the most open-minded people who've you know yeah. had to shirk the the horrible sort of you know recipe for how one is supposed to be um and there there you would find you know lots of goths because that's the place to go if you're alternative yeah um, i've certainly noticed yeah. that with with uh, gay clubs and stuff here actually that They'd be the most tolerant and open-minded places that they, they really don't care what you're into or what you look like or whatever. Yep. And so you yep. get, you, you're just getting a, I mean, you know, obviously there's a bunch of gay people there <laughs> and, and a bunch yep. of people with different sexualities, but far beyond that, I mean, you'll get, say, a lot of people with, say, obvious disabilities, um, yep. you know, um, uh, who, who look just unusual physically because of some reason, like they, who really feel like there's nowhere else that they can go where they won't be kind of judged or stick up, stick out or or um, looked down upon or something. They're, they'll go to the gay clubs because that's somewhere that they know that they can go. Uh, where honestly, not, no one's going to give a fuck. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean. Yeah, and it's, I think what everyone has in common is, is it's the people that have hit, have hit some sort of, you know, it's, um, societal or cultural war it's like mm. society or culture says you know you shall not pass you, you happen to be gay you happen to be trans you happen to be disabled you happen to be even goth whatever you, you know this doesn't this is not okay for our culture so they've hit yeah. this wall that says you're not allowed to be who you are which is shit you know obviously mm. and they have every right to, you know everyone has the right to be who they are so anyone that's hit that wall and experienced that no this is not okay that, you know, you're going to feel at home amongst other people who've also experienced some kind of wall that says, hey, this is not okay. Mm. And that makes you open-minded too. I think that people have had to negotiate 
um, these cultural, you know, regulations that say, oh, this is how you're meant to be and not like that. Uh, they've had to do some, you know, really serious thinking, deep contemplation, self-reflection, and that just makes you a more interesting person. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's yeah, why, it does. Yeah, wherever, whenever I go and live in a new place, it's just like, yeah, where's the gay club? That's mm. that's where I'm going to meet the most interesting people, you know, or at least I can be guaranteed of an interesting conversation. There are interesting people that, you know, aren't so alternative, but, you know, it's just they're in a concentrated group there. It's, it's, a, it's a good bet that you'll find interesting people. Mm. Yeah, that's right. That's um, certainly something I've enjoyed about them. Um, well, oh, let's have a look. See if anyone's uh, asked any questions. Oh yeah, is there, are there any comments or are people just? Oh, uh, there's there's, a, there's certainly <laughs> some comments. Um, let's have a look. Mm. Um, oh, apparently you speak extremely good Polish, uh, often better than <laughs> Polish people. <laughs> I only said one sentence. Mm. Uh, someone, <laughs> someone, um, someone kind of uh, agreed with you about you know hating to talk English to people um, uh, over there. I um, love there. Yeah, an English national trying desperately to you know actually you know immerse themselves in the language. No doubt. Um, if in doubt, say, look, t tell them you're an English teacher, and if they want to talk English with you, they have to pay you by the hour. Win-win. <laughs> <laughs> Win-win. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone would like to recommend um, sci-fi, Samuel Delaney's Babel 17, which has a, something similar to the safe here, Wharf hypothesis as a focal point. Um, oh, interesting. Point out that there's an Australian language that describes the position of things using cardinal map directions. Uh, so what? what's what's happening in a film might be described by that person differently based on what direction the people are actually facing uh, oh, in, in the film. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, th I think that's sort of probably it for questions. Quite a lot of uh, well wishes to people who are pleased to see you and say oh, hi. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I can't see the chat, so I can't see the names. No. Yeah. Um, but hi, thank you guys for tuning in. Yeah, well, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm sort of out of questions, <laughs> more or less. Um, <laughs> are there things that you would like to bring up or talk about that, that we haven't touched on? Ah, uh, I think we've touched on lots of stuff. I'd yeah. like to know what you've been doing for the last few years, actually. Well, Funny. Uh, well we can, we can, we can have that conversation, but. You know, I, I don't think people are here to listen to me. <laughs> so um, maybe uh, uh, yeah, when your podcast yeah yeah. Off, yeah yeah um so so after after this we can we can keep talking if you like um okay well, that, well that's great I really enjoyed this chat and uh, it's been yes, great. I'll just send well wishes to everyone, particularly <laughs> I guess there's a lot of you in England, Poland, and Germany who are under the massive lockdown thing. So mm. look after yourselves and. Yeah, it's cool that you're doing this actually, Barney. Because yeah, a lot of us, it's like this, you you can't get out. So no, well, I mean that that some live stream going on. It's really cool. Yeah, that's right. I mean that's why I started doing Twitch initially, just because I, I basically my I lost a job um, during our lockdown, and it's like, look, I've got all this time. I should do something. Oh, Give this yeah. a go, and then that's that's kind of led on. I mean, I've been nagged by a few people to to do a podcast for a while. So eventually, I cracked. And uh, yeah, and it's yeah, it's been you know something new. It's been good fun, and um, I've actually ended up learning a lot about things that I didn't know I would find interesting, and have ended yeah. up finding it. Well, I mean, like I interviewed uh, Stephen some weeks ago, uh, who's a guy who's really into pinball and craft beer. Uh, possibly not, wow. possibly, possibly not in that order. And <laughs> as, just as a con, just as a consequence of that conversation, I have become interested in both pinball. Uh, and craft beer, so it's some new uh, hobbies yeah. at the moment. Really curious, Barney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's the yeah. thing. Um, I remember having this conversation with someone else actually who was similar. That I don't find it hard to be interested in things, you know. And I'm sure you're mm. the same. Uh, that yeah. once you like look into almost anything and become aware of how much complexity and thought and what a, a huge world is behind yeah. just the superficial aspects of the thing, it's very easy to to become 
I'm interested Intrigued in that thing. Yeah. yeah. Get, getting curious. Eh? Yeah. Ah, that reminds me of something. It's, it wasn't like on my list of things to say, oh, and go it, ahead. it might sound a bit wacky. But um, have you have you ever done your enneagram type? Do you know what your enneagram type is? Um, remind me of what one um, that it's, is. It's my type, and uh, the type five is basically the, the investigator or, or, or inventor okay. or whatever it's called. But they're, they're basically someone that who's you know one of the core drives is, is this curiosity. Oh. But they also have, you know, the ability to, to be a bit detached when necessary. So, you know, they take the observer position right. uh, quite readily. They're often introverts. Uh, I know that one fairly well because I'm a five myself. Right. Well, but, uh, I... The reason I bring it up is yeah. also uh, it's super good for um, pointing out one's blind spots, um, mm. like aspects of your character that you didn't even know you had. Um, and then when it's pointed out to you, yeah, Jesus, I have that. Wow. Um, and the test is you do, because obviously you can go to various places to yeah. do the test and you often get different results. Um, yes. but a lot of people say the one that makes you the most embarrassed, that's yes. probably the one that is you. Um, Man. cause yeah, you look at it and cause we're all so used to, you know, tearing ourselves apart. You're just mm. like, Oh fuck, I don't want that to be me. Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't want to be doing that. Um, and yeah, it, it also helps you because it, it points out your strengths, which there's like the fish with water thing. You don't see your own strengths either because to you, they're, they're easy things to accomplish. So right. you just do them. Like you're, you're a curiosity, you know, you said you, you, you described it as, as what just like giving up on things when actually you're driven by a greater curiosity to something new. Um, right. And the Enneagram just helps you see those things as a positive whilst also pointing out these blind spots and, you know, offering ways to, sort of help you work on them. It's, it's just like a model, you know, any, like any psychological model, but it just seems to be quite a useful one. I, I found it useful. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll link that out too. I've done, uh, I know my, well, my Myers-Briggs one is a little bit interesting because um, I'm always I and N, and I think I'm like 80% I, but the, the second two, um, uh, like they constantly change. I'm very cuspy and usually range between 45 and 55%. So... I think yeah. technically that would make me like I N X X, and I've done like a yeah. I'm a little I, yeah. Me too. But I test often as I N F J. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean sometimes I'm I N F J when I test, but always the last two are very close, and the first two aren't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I've done the big five, but I can't really remember <laughs> um, what they were. What's the, what's the big five? Well, I think it's it's you know it's a psychology one where like these are the uh, the five pairs of most stable attributes that personalities tend to have over time. Uh, like ah. ones, uh, ones like openness versus closed mindedness. Yeah. And I think conscientiousness is one. Um, I mean, it's like O C E A N ocean. I don't know. I shouldn't try and remember things without looking them up first, but that's, um, oh, if, if I look up the big five, the, yeah. the, the big five psychology or something like that, uh, Let's have a look. Big five personality. Yeah. Uh, big five factor. There we go. The ocean model. Oh, well, I got that right. So uh, neuroticism, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, and agreeableness. Uh, and then kind of their, their mirror opposites for each quality. And then just finding out where you, you lie along those continuum. That continuum. Uh, yeah. And one of them, yeah, the opposite of, um, I suppose, cautiousness is curiosity. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's another good one to look at because I suppose it's it, they put a lot of work into does, it. Does and... it offer you sort of you know ways to <laughs> to you know deal with <laughs> deal with one's own well? Or... I mean, I'm, look, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's an industry in that, surely. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, yeah. There's, a, there's an industry in all of that stuff. Um, well, I sent you a link for it anyway, so you can check that out later. Um, Okay, well, that's great. Uh, I so also what... think often, yeah, it's, it, it's not about eternal truth. It's about whether it's useful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've gotten a lot more pragmatic as I've gotten older in that sense too. Like things that I would have rejected when I was younger, mm. I'm now at least like, okay, I don't need to really understand why, how, if it works. You know, if the, if the cost of trying something out is low, uh, both in terms of, you know, time and effort and money, it's like, and if I've got some problems, like, and I've tried other things, I'll be like, I'll give it a go. I mean, I've been, I've actually been seriously contemplating acupuncture, acupuncture, uh, lately. 
Oh, for, for do a, it because it's for well, what? Well, yeah, for what? What problem? Yeah, well, uh, well, I've got this um, uh, plantar fasciitis on on my right foot, and it kind of comes and goes, and it's quite annoying, and you know, gets in the way of some sports stuff. Um, and I've, you know, that the, I've found that really helpful. Yeah. yeah well, I've I've run into quite a lot of I've run into quite a lot of people who just swear by it, and you know, people I would regard as, um, you know, quite rational, logical, sensible people. So I'm like, well, it's going to cost me 25 bucks to check it out. So oh, what's, the, what's the worst that can happen, right? Doesn't work. Oh, well. Oh. Um, so, yeah, things like that. Whereas once I would have just gone, huh, yeah. you know, I think the proposed mechanism yeah. for its operation is bullshit. Therefore, I'm not even going to investigate it further. Or continue to be curious about it or try it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, yeah. Show me the yeah. scientific evidence of your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, yeah. or I will not continue to talk to you. So much richer than just what we can what we can prove with a certain scientific method. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And also, I mean, like, even if things, some things are like placebo effect or sure. mostly placebo effect, it's like, well, it still fixes the problem. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really matter if my brain is doing it well, yeah, by tricking right. my that's body. Right. It's like I don't, I don't feel pain anymore. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah. anyway. There was um, oh, one, one of those uh, famous famous nuclear physicists. Um, he had some, um, I think it was a horseshoe that he, or some other, you know, talisman that yeah. he used to bring him good luck. And you know, he was a known physicist. Someone might correct us on the chat who it is because I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jamie, look it up. Why do you, yeah, you can try and look it up. And and someone said to him, you know, why do you have the superstitious thing? You know, you're a, you're a man of science and whatnot. Uh, you don't believe in that stuff. And he says. Yeah, no, I don't, but I hear that it works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That was Niels Bohr, apparently. Ah, uh, yeah, Bohr yeah, so, it was. Yeah, yeah. so he was, he was a big deal, that guy. Yeah, nice. yeah, exactly. And so, am I think he's right. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if it's true or it does it work. Yeah. Um, well, brilliant. Well, uh, thanks so much for your time, Jordan. Um, oh, thank, thank you, Barney. It's been real cool to talk to you. Yeah, it has. It's... Uh, you know, I mean, obviously we've had some contact, but it's it's nice to hear your voice again, and yeah, uh, and catch up. Thank you. Yeah. Um. And uh, we'll uh, let's let's not leave it for uh, eleven years again. Yeah. Let's, uh... yeah, let's not. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Do you, are you gonna stop the podcast and you can tell me? Um. Well. Yes. Well. Uh, so the the format that I normally do is like um we'll stop talking and we can just mute you a little bit for a while. I'll just read my kind of poem. Yeah. That I read at the end. I, oh. I just choose a poem and read it, and uh, and then yeah, then we can continue our chat, and I'll I'll fill you in on my life, maybe if cool. you like. Cool. Yeah, please, please. All right, take care. Absolute pleasure. See ya. Check again in a minute. Well, that was amazing. Um, Oh, I had I had such a good time uh, today. I actually feel quite sort of uh, awake and motivated and lively after uh, for well over three hours today. The poem I chose uh, to see us out today. I was looking for a poem about friendship because you know Jordan and I are friends and have been friends for a long time. Uh, so I thought it was sort of on theme, and I read it. I read a bunch, um, but this is the one that I kind of liked and stuck with me. It's called Tug of War by Shel Silverstein. I will not play at tug of war. I'd rather play at hug of war where everyone hugs instead of tugs, where everyone giggles and rolls on the rug, where everyone kisses and everyone grins and everyone cuddles and everyone wins. See you again soon. Take it easy.